Good morning. The Washington DC conference will now come to order. Please disable all electronic devices or place them in the silent mode. Oh, I don't think mine is here. Where's yours? My first one? Is my page here? Because I don't think mine's on silent. <laughs> anyway, we'll have to find her. Uh, please rise and remain standing for the opening ceremonies. The chair calls upon Americanism Chairman Martha Lee Thatcher to lead, uh, the, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance and the National Anthem. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight, or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rockets red glare, the bombs bursting in. that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the National Chaplain Shelley Riggs will offer the invocation. Friends, before you pray, believe. Before you speak, listen. Before you spend, earn. Before you write, think. Before you quit, try. Before you die, live. Almighty God, bless and guide President Nancy as she conducts our session today. Be with our servicemen and women and keep them in your care. Watch over us as we prepare to listen to today's speakers and take home this information to our fellow members. Mend a quarrel, seek out a friend, dismiss your doubts with trust, write a letter and share a treasure. Answer softly, encourage youth, share mercy in your word and deed. Keep a promise, find the time. Forgo a grudge, forgive an enemy. Listen, apologize, and try to understand. Examine your demands on others. Think first of, your, of someone else. Appreciate, be kind and gentle. Laugh a little, go to church welcome a stranger, and gladden the hearts of a child. May all that we do glorify your holy name. Amen. Uh, the chair calls uh, Kathy Duncan, National Constitution and Bylaws Chairman, to lead us in the preamble to our Constitution. For God and country, we associate ourselves together for the following purposes, to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States of America, 
to maintain law and order, to foster and perpetuate a 100% Americanism, to preserve the memories and incidents of our association during the great wars, to inculcate a sense of individual obligation to the community, state, and nation, to combat the autocracy of both the classes and the masses, to make right the master of might, to promote peace and goodwill on earth, to safeguard and transmit to posterity the principles of justice, freedom, and democracy, to participate in and contribute to the accomplishments of the aims and purposes of the American Legion, to consecrate and sanctify our association by our devotion to mutual helpfulness. Thank you, Kathy. Please be seated. So before I get into this written script, I want to know, did you all have a great time yesterday? <laughs> it was terrific. What that, It was absolutely incredible. It was so amazing to see it actually come together. And I think I saw Bob back there in the back. Bob, are you back there? Thank you, Bob. <laughs> It was really, really incredible. So just a little bit that uh, staff, uh, I know everybody wants to know when it's going to be on YouTube. Um, it probably will take about a week for it to come up. So if you imagine that they have seven different tracks that all have to come together, um, it takes at least seven hours to download all of that to bring it all together. Once it's together, you will, all of you, receive an email notification with a link um, to the YouTube um, uh, video. Once you get it, please, please, please pass it on. Because that's why, we, that's why we had that great flash mob. And Stephanie did show me just a little clip of everybody waving their American flags in those red, white, and blue t-shirts. It, it's incredible to see, so it's gonna be really exciting. So don't forget, everybody send it to Ellen, okay? Everybody send it to Ellen. And if you're not a, if you don't follow her yet on Twitter, you can do that easily so that you can pass it on to her. Um, go on her website, you can, you'll be able to find it. So that's pretty exciting. So what an honor it is. Oh, goodness. Things are falling apart here. What an honor it is to be standing in front of all of you this morning. With everything going on in our world, it is very important that we, as an organization, stand together with our Legion family the government, and other organizations to help those fighting for our freedom. As I traveled around for my, from with, in my department visits and national meetings, I have met and made connections with so many men and women who have all been affected by wars. It is because of them that we as a service organization exist. I am proud that we have an organization in our nation also willing to help. Today we will hear from several presenters that will share their knowledge and provide us with even more opportunities to serve our veterans, active duty, and military families. Mary Davis, will you please join me on stage to moderate our first session? Thank you, Nancy. Good morning, everyone. It's my privilege to begin today's program with a session on our, mil our nation's military children. The well-being of military children is a hot topic. This morning, we are pleased to bring to you the, finding, uh, the findings of two such reports. First, we will hear from Ron Haskins of the Center on Children and Families at the Brookings Institution, one of the nation's top independent research institutions. We will also hear from Terrell Wicks of Boys and Girls Clubs of America. 
They convened a Great Thinks Symposium on military children and youth issues last fall. The American Legion Auxiliary was represented at this symposium. Our last speakers this morning will bring a personal touch to the top topic of military children. Vivian Greentree and her sons will share their story with us. It is my pleasure uh, to tell you a little bit about Ron Haskins. He is a senior fellow at the Economic Studies Program and co-director of the Center on Children and Families at the Brookings Institute. From February to December of 2002, he was a senior advisor to the President for Welfare Policy at the White House. Ron spent 14 years on the staff of the House Ways and Means Human Resource Subcommittees. His areas of expertise include welfare reform, child care, child support, marriage, child protection, and budget and deficit issues. Ron served in the Marine Corps from 1963 to 1966. I am pleased to introduce Mr. Haskins. America fights a lot of wars. I'm very interested in these wars. I've been reading about them for years and years and years and watching. I love to watch the History Channel and see all the men fighting and so forth. The thing that always gets left out, or almost always, of our histories and our films and our movies is the families that are left behind, and especially the children in those families. I think you could grow up in America and know about America being a great nation that can defend itself and has a wonderful military and never hear anything about the consequences of war for families. And that's why I'm here to talk to you today, because I think at last, the nation, and especially policymakers, and especially the military itself, is paying some attention to this issue and trying to do things. I don't think we're doing enough, this is the bottom line in my presentation, but we're moving in the right direction. And I'd like to talk to you just a little bit about those directions. So is, the, is my, I can make it go forward? Okay. Oh, there it is. Good. Okay. Uh, so the problem, I can't read it, but I can see it. Um, there are a whole range of problems that have to do with families and the soldiers that fight our wars, both men and women. Um, parent absence is a major issue. Many people don't think much about that. But we have a huge literature in developmental psychology that single parent families, kids who grew up in single parent families, have a lot more problems, uh, are more likely to be thrown out of school, more, more likely to have mental health issues and so forth. So that in itself is an issue. And then, of course, there are the injuries to deal with. Uh, those, are off, those often do get some public attention. Um, but there are also mental and emotional injuries which cannot usually be observed. Uh, Post-traumatic stress disorder and several others that you can see there. And then finally, and the issue that I'm the most concerned with is the impacts on children. Uh, Reese, I work, I'm an editor of a journal called Future of Children, which is quite an interesting journal. Some of you may be interested in it. If you Google Future of Children, it'll come right up and everything we do is available there. This issue that we published last year is devoted entirely to military families. And almost every chapter touches on what we know about the children in military families and also intervention programs to help them uh, when, they're, when they are suffering the, the problems that sometimes occur when their parents go deploy and go into action. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. So here are the numbers. They're astounding to me. Uh, two million have served in the war zones in, the la in our last two wars. 6,800 deaths, 50,000 physical injuries, way more than that, mental injuries and the kind that you can't see. There's not really a good estimate. Um, and let me just introduce an idea here right at the beginning that I think is really important, and that is when we think about the consequences of war, you could apply this to physical injuries as well, but I'm talking primarily now about emotional and mental uh, injuries. There's a continuum of injuries, and some toward the light end, you might call it, are not horribly serious. A, a child may get in trouble in school more often, but with the proper support, they can overcome it. They have great internal strengths. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then on the other end are really serious emotional traumatic issues often occur in, when the families have difficulty helping a child. And then there's everything in between. So two million kids are involved in, um, have been involved in since the 
since the Iraq War. Uh, and some of those children, as we'll see in just a second, are having issues. So here I want to talk first about some of the studies. Uh, this is an interesting study done by Chandra and colleagues. Uh, 1,500 military children, a very big sample, ages 11 to 17, done by telephone. And here were the effects. For older boys and girls of all ages, they had excessive problems in school compared to national norms. There were more conflicts within their family at home and in places where families go, and they had more conflicts with peers. So these are all flags. Think of this continuum, maybe not real serious, some more serious, some very serious. And longer deployments led to more problems. And because the way we're fighting our wars now, many of our men and women have to serve two and even three. A few times I've heard of people even four times in war zones. The longer they're gone, the more they serve, the more the family suffers, the more problems the kids have in school and in community settings. And another finding from this study, and I select this study because it's representative of the, lit of the literature. And by the way, we didn't have a literature in the past, so we were these things that we know now. I mean, many people might have suspected them, but half the function of social sciences didn't confirm what everybody already knows. So uh, here we're doing that again. Uh, and here's a finding that you might not think of, and that is that the severity of the problem the likelihood that there's any problem and then the severity of the problem is related to the, to the mental health and the stability of the parents, which in many cases means the mother, sometimes the father, but much more often the mother. So that is a major factor, and if we had a really good strategy, we would be really concerned about the mental health of the parent left behind, usually the mother, and we would offer all kinds of services. We do offer some. Uh, but I think we would offer even more and they would be more effective. Uh, a second uh, type of effect, this is based on outpa outpatient treatment records and social sciences is worth something. Different sources of data show the same, same result. 310,000 children, a huge sample, age 5 to 17, and they compared the records in this study of children whose parents were not deployed and children whose parents were deployed for 1 to 11 months and then more than 11 months, so those three groups. And children with deployed parents had more acute stress reactions. Stress is a fancy word. It has all kinds of physiological correlates, uh, uh, especially cortisol, which has all sorts of effects on, uh, uh, on biology, and it uh, uh, has effects on people's behavior as well. So stress is a major issue. It's caused by situations, uh, just not to be techno, to be unpleasant, and people worry about it. And the more they worry, the more stress they feel. The more stress they feel, it has physiological impacts on their body and in turn has impacts on their behavior. Depression, there's also excess depression uh, in parents who are left behind. And they're even up to and including more toward this end of the spectrum behavioral disorders. Again, the finding, this is many, many studies, the longer the deployment, more problems. In fact, if we were really worried about families, we would do everything we could to make sure people do not get deployed more than once, at least over an extended period of time, and certainly never more than twice. So that is a message that the military could take away, but as I'll say in a few minutes, it's unlikely that we're going to be able to do that. Here's the third uh, set of effects. Uh, this has to do with child abuse and neglect. Uh, I'm happy to tell you that for many years, at least a decade, maybe a little bit more, that several studies indicated that abuse and neglect was declining among military families, probably because of the elevated requirements for people getting into the military. So we have a different kind of person in the military, so there was less abuse, and uh, both physical abuse and neglect among parents. And the rates were falling until 2001. That date may strike a bell with you. That's the date that we uh, got involved in Iraq, and in, I mean in, in Afghanistan and subsequently in Iraq. And there are at least three studies that now show that since 2001, neglect has been going up among military families, so it's increasing. And one study even shows that there's an increase in physical abuse. It's not a huge increase, but there is a significant increase in physical abuse. Once again, indicating the issues that we create in the way we fight our wars and separate families, and it has an impact on both the mother and the children. It has an independent impact, and then the two of them together, especially the mental health of the mother, interact uh, to determine the outcome. 
So here are four conclusions from the research. I've only shown you a small piece of research. If you're interested, you could Google future of children and look into this in much greater detail with way more details on the studies. So parent deployment increases stress-related problems in both parents and children. Stress disrupts normal parenting, and especially among parents who had problems in the first place. Solid evidence of elevated rates of problems in both parents and children. So there's the, there's the issue of the stress and the deployment and the stress, and then it leads to behavior problems, especially in school and in the community. And as I've said several times, longer deployments mean more problems. Now, fortunately, our military families have lots of sources of resilience. It's a great thing, but I think sometimes we overemphasize it. We expect too much of these families, even though they are more resilient and there are many sources of support. The issues are so big and the barriers that they face, especially because of deployment, are really quite important. So here are sources of resilience. Warm and stable relationships with parents, as I've suggested several times, if there are problems between the parent and the child in the first place, then separation uh, makes those even more serious and more acute. The military culture and, belong and belonging is an extremely important part of this. People in the military take great pride in their role defending the country. They often have very responsible jobs. I'd say easily a majority, maybe a much higher percentage than that, have challenging, interesting jobs. Uh, and they bring that home. They're happy with their, what they're doing. They're proud of themselves. Often their spouses are proud as well. And that is communicated to the child. And then there's a perception that the nation is grateful. I was in the Marine Corps during the war in Vietnam. My brother was then also and was severely injured. And I recall distinctly that he was, when he was injured, he was, had worn bandages and everything hobbling through the airport in Los Angeles, and someone spit on him. If, for those of you out there who were alive during this time, you know that the nation was extremely hostile uh, to the idea of our war in Vietnam, and they often took it out on servicemen. So it's a really, it's a very, very bad thing. And that has completely changed. The military is one of the most popular institutions in our society. That's communicated in many, many ways through the media and through the way people react to people in the military. So there is the perception that the nation is grateful, and that helps. And then last and very important, we now have much better prevention and treatment programs. Not enough. I do not want to paint a rosy picture here. But we're doing better. And the military, the top echelons, seem to be more concerned than they were in the past. So I want to emphasize again this range of reactions. If we're concerned about the impacts, especially on children, there can be modest and temporary problems that can be dealt with with a, with a light touch, but there can be very serious problems that require therapy and extremely important uh, and successful intervention programs. And there are many diagnosed problems, as you know, uh, both for adults and for children. So that range of reaction. I want to mention just one program. It's called FOCUS. If you Google um, FOCUS military intervention, I think it comes right up. You can find out a lot about FOCUS. It's also reviewed in this volume. It's probably the most interesting and the most complex of the programs. It was developed by a team of UCLA at Harvard. They did a lot of preliminary work with the Navy and the Marine Corps. It has three major elements. It has family education element, a structured communication about development of children, and then uh, development of family resilience skills. And the way it's administered usually is that there are six to eight sessions, meet separately with each of the parents and with the parents together, meet separately with the children, and then meet with the parents and the children together. And during that time, talk to them about their issues, the, the um, counselors involved, they're trying to get a picture of the family and see if there are problems, uh, and then st start thinking about solutions. And they finally bring them together and try to open communication among family members, which is often a crucial part of the problem, that the family is not aware of the children's problems, often until they develop into very serious. Um, and then sometimes there's individual therapy if that's required. So you have this very systematic approach involving both the kids and the parents, trying to bring them together to strengthen their resiliency and their skills of communication, which is a crucial part in any therapy. Communication with the people around you and an understanding and a warmth is extremely important in any therapy, uh, no less so than in this kind of therapy. And there has been fairly good research. I don't want to bore you to death with research, but a lot of research is not great. And they might get an answer, but you, it's hard to depend on it. Good research 
w has really shown the way to a number of interventions in medical sciences and in social sciences that really work well. <clears throat> Preschool is a good example. Home, a program called home visiting where uh, nurses and other trained professionals visit, especially low-income single mothers who are going to have problems in their homes and teaches them about their personal life and about breastfeeding, about the importance of various approaches to child rearing. These have been well studied, very good studies, and we know that they can have an effect, and in some cases we know the effect can last for many years. We've not yet had what I would call really that high quality research. Nonetheless, this is very good research. I think it's extremely promising. We should invest more money in doing the exploratory work for these programs. They can work. They could be much more successful. We need to spend more money on them. I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. Um, the focus. Uh, I just want to show you that there are effects from the FOCUS program. So there's a, re a reduction in self-reported distress symptoms, improvement in self-reported family functioning, and there are even eff effects on the kids. There's a reduction in overall difficulties. I told you there were excess difficulties, especially in school, and those decline. And children age 7 and older reported an increase in the use of positive coping strategies, which they were taught. It's always nice. You teach kids coping strategies, and then you see them use them in their home, in their community, and in their school. So these programs programs can be effective, I think, and they can be much more effective, and we need more of them. So here's what we need now, I think. First, we need a national treatment plan. This is going to be extremely difficult because we have military bases all over the country and overseas, but even more difficult when people leave the military, as so many people do, they go all over the country. So it, how can you think of a plan to continue helping those families when they're really dispersed around the country? So that's a big issue. We need to think a lot more about that. As I've already said, we need more research and development on programs like FOCUS. I think we're moving in the right direction. We found some success. We can do a lot better uh, if we spend more money on these programs. And the last thing I want to leave you with is extremely unfortunate. I'm sure all of you were of this, and that is that we are, the federal government is in debt. Um, we're in kind of a level phase right now uh, where things are not getting too much worse, uh, but soon they will start getting worse again as the baby boomers like me retire and collect Social Security and even more important, Medicare. Medicare is a much bigger problem than Social Security. Uh, so we are really tight. And if you look at a grand uh, chart of the budget of the United States, you can already see if you put medical care it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and everything else is shrinking, including spending on defense. We are going to have years of decreased spending on defense unless we have another war. Um, I think even if Republicans were elected, they're generally more sympathetic to defense spending, but a number of Republicans have not fought against these cuts as they have in the past. So there seems to be something like, I know it probably challenges your credulity to say there could be some bipartisan in Washington, but I think there is some, a lot of agreement on defense cuts. So that re doesn't remove, but it minimizes the possibility that we can A, do the kind of development work and research that we need, and B, per expand the services and figure out how to get these services to families around the country. So I think we're, the glass is half full. We're developing new techniques, there's a new appreciation, but there also are growing problems and our money is getting shorter. I'm not overly optimistic. So groups like this have a very important role to lobby the Congress and to focus on helping these families. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ron. Now we have time for a question or two from our audience. Um, as our members make their way to a microphone, and if you have questions, if you would please go to the microphones. Um, I have a question for you. Um, you spent your career as a professional staff member, member on Capitol Hill. Um, would you provide your perspective on general attitude in Congress about military children and family matters? Uh, for example, are the life circumstances of military children and families well understood by our elected officials? Two points. The first one is I do think there's a great appreciation for the military 
in the Congress. I was with the Ways and Means Committee for 14 years. I was in the White House for a year. It was a Bush White House. There was an amazing sympathy for military families and concern in the Bush White House. I think there is an Obama White House as well, but I think Obama's, we're in a phase of cutting spending. So the second part of my answer is the real response depends on, it comes down, forget what they say. It's time to vote. And when they vote, do they vote yes for cuts in military spending? Do they vote and when those cuts involve the kind of issues that we're talking about here? That's what really counts. So I think that there's more of a willingness in Congress now to vote yes for cuts in military spending, or if they kind of, you got to be careful with these guys in Congress, you know. Um, they often figure things out so they don't directly vote on a certain thing. It's in a bill, a huge bill, and it has all these provisions, and they vote yes on the bill, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they specifically focus on this one provision in the bill. So I would be concerned. Thank you. I think there's a question over there. Yes. Uh, I was a military wife for 24 years. And my husband was in and out of various situations. But I wanted to know if in your studies there was a difference between the mothers being redeployed more than once as opposed to the fathers being redeployed. As a mother who stayed home and dealt with the issues of the kids. I, I don't think that there's a study that addresses this question well. I'm a developmental psychologist. I've done a lot of studies of mothers and the relationships between mothers and children. Um, I was a single parent for many years myself with custody of my children, so I'm going to speak against men for a moment. It is what it is. Uh, I think, especially for younger children, that women are more important to the relationship with a child. And I bet if we had a very good study, a large sample, and left half the kids home with their fathers and a mother deployed, and then vice versa, the kids that, whose mothers left, I think would be worse off. But I can't say that based on research, because I don't think we have a good study like that yet. And as you probably know very well, deployment of women is a fairly new thing. Uh, so we don't have a research literature, but I would be concerned about it. It's a very good question. Do we have other questions? I think we do. Just one coming up here. Oh, okay. You were speaking about a national treatment plan. Would there be, especially with defense cuts, if the VA in and of itself started working on a treatment plan to include families as opposed to just singly, whether or not it's a male or female veteran, mm -hmm. because in my area, it's very, very difficult to try to make an appointment for a mental health professional right. for the family or even the wife if the husband's deployed or even fam the, yes. the young kids. Yes. If the VA were involved with it more, we might be able to reach out to the community outreach programs or the outpatient clinic where they could include family in that national treatment plan. Is there mm -hmm. anything that might work down the line for that? Well, it is a very complicated, it's a great question, but it's an extremely complex question because we have to have the availability of mental health services, those are the equally important to the physical services, and there are more people involved. So we have to have the availability of those services, which we do not have everywhere in the country. In major cities, we tend to have a lot of hospitals and a lot of services, but there are many places in the country where we don't have an, enough services to go around. So the answer is, no matter who's involved, until we do something about those services, I don't think we're going to be able to have a good plan. Now, if you talk to people in the VA and even people on the, on the uh, Armed Services Committees in the Congress, they will say they're thinking about this issue. They're aware that the, you have to have a national plan because the military families are dispersed. Even when they're stationed in bases, they're still very dispersed around the country. But when they leave the military, it's even more dispersed. So they have to have a national plan. They're thinking about it. But we don't really have one. So I think if the VA were more involved, but they cannot solve the money problem. I think at the base here, money is a big issue. 
I think the military is way more aware of this problem than they have been in the past, but I, I think we're going to have a tough time finding solutions. And a lot of it, I, I don't like to say this, but a lot of it is going to be based on the actions of voluntary organizations like this one. Without, the, I mean, that's something that we really could stimulate and do without additional federal resources. And God knows Americans need to learn to live and persist and flourish without a lot of government benefits. We've done it throughout our history. There's no reason we can't do it now. Yes. Good morning, sir. Good morning. First of all, thank you for your service. And I apologize for the treatment of your brother. I think that is horrible, and none of us in this room would have done that. Well, there were many, many servicemen that had a lot worse than my brother had. It was a bad time. It was ugly. My question to you is, <clears throat> are you a member of the American Legion family? Of the what? Oh. No. Then, then I ask a special request this morning. I would like to gift you with a membership in our organization if you would accept. I would do that. I, I have to tell you that something else in my life is going to have to give because I'm a member of many, many organizations, serve on boards and all that, so I try to budget this time. I'm, I'm interested. If you want to talk further about it, I have to compare it to other things that I'm doing, and something would have to give. So I'm very flattered to be asked, though. Even as a card-carrying member, you still support other veterans that you served with, and we would be honored to have you as a part of our family. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yes. Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning. In regard to the member's question about services for the family, all across the country there are vet centers springing up that offer counseling to the veterans, and the vet center in northern New Hampshire, where I live, also provides counseling for the families. Uh, it's pretty much a full service uh, vet center. And if they don't, they can direct them to where they could get help that they might need. So that's some something to look at. All right, wait, that's exactly the point I'm making. We need that. that that's something that we can, can, can control and groups like this can control. So that's a wonderful thing. I, I congratulate you for that. Thank you. Good morning. Well, let's go over here and then I'll come back. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Mary Ward from the Department of North Carolina. I'm a military brat, but more importantly than that, I was a high school teacher near an Air Force Bay. How can the schools get more assistance in working with those children? It's sometimes a problem, although it's gotten better. Yes. Um, I don't know a good answer to that question. I'm aware of the issue. Uh, I talked to, when I was doing research for this volume, I talked to a few people about it. It has not risen to the top, I don't think, as a major issue, but it is a very important issue. I think if teachers especially had a better understanding of the problems that these kids face, the kid comes in a classroom, sometimes they might not even know it's a military child, and the child acts out, they respond, and you know this, you were teachers always, I was a teacher myself, and you're well aware of the kids that cause difficulty and act out, uh, and so the teachers respond. But if they had more knowledge of the child's situation, and this applies not just to military, in general, teachers have more information about the family background and the problems that kids face, at least they're more sympathetic it makes them warmer and less harsh in their discipline of the child, I think, and more understanding. So <clears throat> I think that would be a good thing. I wish we had a systematic way to do more of that. And again, I think that's the kind of thing a group like this can participate in. Okay, and since I followed the lady who talked to you about Legion, is by any chance any of your children a female? I have two uh, young, I have, I have no young children. I have two boys and two girls. Your daughters would be eligible for membership in the American Legion Auxiliary then, and we would welcome them. Well, I guess this is a national recruiting conference, huh? That's... <laughs> yes, over here. Yes, 
I just want to follow up also on the um, mental health for service members and families. I am also a member of the National Association of Social Workers and a, a practitioner and educator. And I want you to know that um, our profession has gotten the word that working with military families is a specialty. There are many um, universities offering specialized training working with military families. And the more we can get the word out that this is a need, I think the more it will grow. Yes, I think that that last point is really important. I think Americans, it's a great, I mean, I brought up Vietnam because the contrast between then and now is so great. And it's such a good thing that the country generally backs our military efforts and our military, as I said, it's polls show over and over again, there's just no question, the military is one of the most respected institutions in our society. So I think the background for that kind of appeal is there, not just for social workers, but doctors, uh, community workers, teachers, as was brought up over here. There's much more sympathy, and if, it's org if an approach is organized and has specific recommendations, and I emphasize that, don't go to a group unless you have specific, we want you to do A, B, C, that's how you could help us. I think it could be very successful, way more than in the past. Thank you. And one last question. Wanda Moore, Department of North Carolina. As this is all about the families left behind and, and spotlighting on the children, one issue that we see as we are involved at Fort Bragg and Camp Lejeune are the children of single moms. I see no plan that, I see no plan, you can tell me if I'm wrong, that for children of single moms who have no family support, what are they supposed to do with their children when they're deployed for a year? Right, um, first let me make a very positive point and that is, I've been around quite a while as you can tell by looking at me, uh, and I lived through the period starting, I would say, maybe 25 years ago, when the military really became aware of how important preschool programs and daycare are. And I would say that the military facilities have daycare programs and preschool programs that are better, definitely better than average in the United States. So they greatly increase the quality of their program. Now this is part of the answer to the question. The broader question, I just don't know, I, th I think the real answer is relatives, and beyond that, I don't. I don't. Th I would not be optimistic that the military would be able to develop a broad, effective program for providing 24-hour care. By the way, we normally call that foster care. We have a lot of kids in our society. You know, 350,000 or so at any moment. Sometimes, in the past, as many as 500,000 that are in an organization, an institution called foster care, because they have problems in their family with abuse or neglect. And we know that. Family, if, if children are, with the exception of adoption, children not related to the parents and parents having been with them their whole life, they're better than being with a family that abuses them, but those kids are more likely to have all the very kind of problems we're talking about here. So if mothers go away and serve for a year, I hope their families can really pick up the slack because that's the only solution I would be confident in. If it were my family, that's what I would want. I would want my mom or my wife's mom to assume the responsibility for the children because I think anything short of that, we will have more problems than we would if the family was together. Wonderful presentation, Ron. Thank, Thank you. you so much for sharing such Thank pertinent information with yeah. us. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you Thank so you. much. Terrell Wicks is the National Vice President of Military Outreach Services for Boys and Girls Club of America. She brings over 27 years of experience in child, child and youth development, holding positions in the federal, private, and nonprofit sector. Previously, Terrell served as head for children, youth, and teen programs with the Marine Corps, providing an providing oversight for youth and teen programs serving 57,000 children ages 6 to 18. It is with great pleasure that I introduce uh, Terrell Wicks. Welcome. 
Good morning. It is indeed an honor to be here and share with you the work that we're doing at Boys and Girls Clubs. And I have the privilege, we had an opportunity on September 13th to bring together for the first time individuals and experts from the academic environment, from the government, from the military, military families, to really talk about how to serve military youth. So that initially was, was our thought. And again, as you can imagine, when you get together with that large group that, you know, recommendations and some key understandings comes out of that. So I'm gonna share that with you. Before I do that, one of the things that I wanna talk about is, is sort of our work with Boys and Girls Subs and why we thought this was so important. One of the things that we identified with Boys and Girls Clubs, we've actually had an opportunity to work with the military for about two decades. Today, we serve about 700,000 military kids in clubs off the installation and in about 400 clubs that are on installations. And we were going through these programs, talking to families, and, and again, understanding that we had programs that were working, but when we were talking to the families, we understood that there were still opportunities that we needed to make sure that we paid attention to. And so what we decided to do is we said, you know, we really can't do this as an organization on our own. We really need to bring in some experts to help us understand how we need to redouble our effort, redouble our commitment, and also make sure that we are providing programs and services that are meeting particularly the gaps in, thank you, <laughs> that are meeting the gaps in services for military children. So what we decided to do is we brought together a panel and a panel of experts, and I'll share with you who those experts were. There we go, good. Um, and, 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 and out of that came the Great Things paper, so I'll come back to this. But what we decided to do is bring together a panel. And the panel included Dr. Sloan Gibson, or, from, or not doctor, but the president of USO, Dr. Kenneth Ginsberg, who uh, many of you may know is actually an expert on resiliency. Dr. Lydia Merrick, who talked with us about reintegration. I'll share with you some of the information that she came up with. And then also some individuals from corporations that support military families. And then also Mr. Greg Young. And they had an opportunity during the, the, the session to talk about just some of the benefits that their programs are providing and also some of the gaps in service. And then we had round tables that we did a discussion. So out of that discussion, we came up with a great think paper. And one of the findings that we identified is that you cannot serve military youth without serving families, that we were doing that in isolation. And so it was loud and clear throughout the entire presentation. And three things came out of that. One, that we needed to do resiliency and that we needed to do more on resiliency for the youth and the families, but that we also needed to understand the reintegration process. And that reintegration was not just a process for military spouses, but we also needed to make sure that we were paying attention to what was happening with military kids during that process. And we needed to do that before, the re before they were deployed, during deployment, and the transition back. And one of the things that Dr. Merrick said to us very clearly is that oftentimes when you have this conversation about reintegration and it doesn't match the actual experience, that those families, 25% of those families' expectations of re reintegration was very different than what actually happened. And so those families tended to be in crisis a little bit more. We also understood that we really needed to make sure that we were preparing military youth for academic success and workforce readiness. So we talked a little bit about STEM and I'll talk with you about that in a moment. But what we found is, you know, we have all these organizations, so you know this more than many, that military youth move often. Um, that they come from one environment, they go to another where the, the, the academic requirements or the programs may be very different. And although we have the interstate compact that all states have not agreed to be a part of that, so we're still having some issues with, with sort of academics. And that we and programs like after school care or programs that are in the schools and outside of the schools needed to really pay attention to that. And so we'll talk about what those recommendations. And then lastly, what we found is that 70% of military families obviously live off installations. And so they don't necessarily have access to many of those programs that are on the base. And so we needed to identify, one, how do we let those families know about services that are available? And two, how do we make sure we get those services to the families? And, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about what the families found. 
So reintegration and resiliency, three things. The first thing we identified, again, we Boys and Girls Subs, we were so excited. We worked with Dr. Ginsburg to develop this great resiliency program. But guess what? The resiliency program actually in the curriculum was developed basically for military youth. And so loud and clear throughout the great things, one of the things that we identified is that we really needed to talk about how do you make a resilient family. And so we, the, one of the key recommendations was as we're looking at resiliency and as we're looking at, you know, we know that military kids are resilient, that they're strong, but that they are some families that are in crisis. And so as we're looking at building resiliency curriculums, resiliency programs, that we needed to look at it in two approaches. That we needed to, one, address families that we also needed to understand that all families that are off the installation do not necessarily come to our programs that are either on an installation or that are in 4,000 4, communities across the United States. And so how do we get that information to those families? We also identified we had all of these military organizations that were supporting these families in the audience. And as you can imagine, we would sit around the table and talk about the support. And there were so many duplications of services or other organizations who did not understand or know that one Department of De Defense Education Activity was providing something or the Department of Defense was providing something. So we really understood that, one, there needed to be a centralized delivery system. And I'll talk about that in a moment so that families understood that that we had these services and then organizations that were doing some of the similar services, how could we better partner together so that we could become stronger and also get those programs to our kids? The other thing that we identified is with the support programs, were the programs actually meeting the needs of the families? Were the programs actually meeting the needs of the kids? And one, were we talking to those individuals to make sure that we were identifying them, that we were making sure that we were building programs that were really based on the needs? And so that was another thing that we looked at. And then also communication, that we found it very difficult, not for those families that were off the installation, but we identified one, we're working with active military members Members, but there is another community out there. What work were we doing with the wounded, ill, and injured? What work were we doing with veterans? What work were we doing with those that were transitioning to military families? And so we found loud and clear that we needed to expand our scope of services to those communities also. And so those were some of the recommendations. And here's so what we found out. Our action items is that we needed to have a proactive report, a, a approach that a lot of the work that we did together as partners and even Boys and Girls Club and, and you know, again, this was a learning experience for us that it was reactive, that it really needed to be based on a proactive approach. And so that was one of the findings for us that we also needed to make sure that we identified and scaled up evidence-based resiliency programs. And simply what that meant is as bringing in doctors and experts and schools and any individual that would touch those families, and again, yes, families, to talk about how do we do these resiliency-based programs, make sure that we have outcome measurements, and make sure that we understand that we develop a system to make sure that they are working and that they're not just programs. And then we also, and I talked a little bit about this, that we needed to form a network of delivery providers. We have all these great programs, and one of the things that we need to do is make sure that we're working better together, that we have a better opportunity to make sure that we're getting that information to families, and that we as partners can't do that alone. And so we identified that. The next thing that we identified is that, you know, really for military kids and military families, as we talked about them moving nine to 12 times before high school, or that they're moving during their high school years, or, or, and, and, and again, the graduation requirements are, are often different. And so how in the after school space and these programs that are sort of working in collaboration with schools, how can we better prepare those kids for academic success and also for workforce readiness. So one of the things that we identified is that we needed to develop programs that were based on college and career readiness, that we understood that kids may go to college or they may go to the military, and that we needed to make sure that we developed programs specifically to help them be on track for academic success or, for, or uh, to be military ready or ready for a career in technology schools. And then we understood that outside the classroom, what are some of the things and opportunities that we needed to make sure we made available after school? 
And one thing was loud and clear. You know, we operated from this space that we needed to really make sure that our after school programs and boys and girls clubs, that our youth programs, that our programs that were online and people have access and youth have access to that um, in a community where they can't get to a center. But one of the things that we identified is that we needed to work better with the schools and we needed to work better with those environment sports programs, identifying those programs that are, although they were after school programs, that we needed to make sure that we collaborate a little better with those and so that although in the after school program we did not want it to mirror school um, but we wanted to make sure that we had opportunities for some invisible learning experiences and then we also found there was a lot of discussion around STEM, a lot of discussion around ensuring that our kids in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, that in any environment that they go into, if they're on the computer, that they needed to have some basic skills in those areas. And so we identified that we really needed to make sure that we upped the opportunities for STEM development in our after school programs. And again, working in collaboration with the schools. And our action steps, again, that we made sure that they were targeted educational opportunities, that we invited experts, that the youth and families had an opportunity to have former veterans, had an opportunity to have former individuals that were specializing in the field to come in and, and sort of speak with them about those programs, and that youth actually had an opportunity to intern in those areas where they were of interest that we also needed to enlist military STEM experts so that those kids that were actually on an installation or that were in an environment in a highly impacted military and community, that we utilize the support and the services there for military kids to participate and military families to participate in sort of STEM opportunities. There were a lot of corporations there around STEM who raised their hand and said, hey, we're, we're, we are ready. We really want to support this. What do you need us to do? And so we've had lots of conversations with organizations about making sure that they support and partner with us. And that we, one of the things that we found, and, and you know, we one of the things that when you're working with military families as an advocate is that you have to stop and say, this is what kids need. I understand that your corporation um, would like to do this, but let's meet in the middle. And so we've had some great dialogue with corporations, but Boys and Girls Clubs has clearly understood that your agenda, although it's great, it will be what's best for military kids. And so we have walked away from some corporations um, that have offered lots of money because you know basically their agenda was a little different and again we've had some great opportunities where we've said this is what kids need this is what families needs you know and if you're able to help support us on that then then we'll, we'll work together and again we decided to do a great think stem on May 20 uh, in May of 2004 where we'll have some more dialogue about that so the last thing that we talked about is really for outreach of military families is that we really needed to create a public-private delivery system. One of the things that we found is that military families don't often know about the services that are available to them unless it's right on the installation. And sometimes not even them. I mean, as a military spouse, I was, some of the opportunities that we had, I learned about a lot of them after my husband left the military. And so, you know, we really, we really needed to determine how do we make sure that we let families know about all the services that are available to them. And we understood that there needs to be a centralized delivery system so that all of these organizations that are doing some of the same work, some doing great work, that we really need to partner together to make sure that we communicate that to, to, to our families. So that was a call to action. Families in the audience simply said, you've got to figure out a way to let us know what's happening. Um, the support services need to be support services that are developed based on our needs. And that we, you guys need to work in partnership. You know, we, we really need to make sure that we are, if we're working with organizations, there's an organization that's great at, at reintegration or there's an organization that's great at resiliency, let's partner together, not sort of create, reinvent what's already been created. And so we found that to be, to, to be very important. And our action steps that came out of that is that we needed to together develop some outreach strategy with a call to action on resiliency and readiness and also reintegration. Um, that we needed to determine how do we market to the different audiences. So how do you market to a veteran? How do you market to a wounded, ill, or injured military uh, member or somebody that's transitioning to, to, to civilian life? We also found that for many of the National Guard and Reserve families that we needed to do a better job of building programs for them and we needed to do a better job of making sure that we were communicating to them and that we were listening to what they needed. 
And again, a, a centralized delivery system and then partnering also with USO was loud and clear for us. So finally, a few things that we, we, we are, have had an opportunity, and again, this happened September 13th, um, and one of the things that we, we, we understood is that we had these key recommendations, we had these key findings, and so what were our next steps? And one of the things that we determined is that we would do a resiliency and reintegration camp that would be not only for youth, but would also be for families. And that that camp would involve resiliency, reintegration curriculum. It would also involve an opportunity to have another conversation with families. And again, the sort of the scope of families that we talked about so that we could talk about, you know, what are some of the things as we're building these curriculums, as we're building these programs, as we're sort of targeting the work that we do with you, what are some of the things that we need to make sure that we're doing as a community, not just boys and girls clubs, but as a part partnership community to make sure that we're, we're targeting our strategies to make sure they'll make a real difference in the lives of our military families. And so that's one of the things that we looked at. And then also making sure that we really focus on the National Guard the, and, and families that are separated from the installation, sharing resources, and then also inviting the Guard and Reserve families to participate in some of these training experiences. So finally, a few things that we, we are, we're, we're really sort of excited about right now is that we understood that many of the families, the way to connect with them, um, although we love the face-to-face -face and being able to talk to them often, that's not realistic. And so we identified that we needed to develop some online strategy and get to military families. And so we're looking at, we have a marketing and communication community that's developed this online outreach guide um, for not only for staff and volunteers, but also for families. And that we're working in partnership with many of the organizations who participated in the Great Think. And then also looking at identifying areas where we have large populations of military families and civilian communities that we need to start there. And then enlisting their help to also make sure that we're spreading that information to other families. One of the best ways to get information to military families is to talk to military families and they talk to other military families, but we really need to make sure that we did that in a strategic and targeted approach. And then also providing training and support. So we do have about 4,000 clubs in civilian communities and 400 on military installations and understanding that we needed to really redouble our effort and, and providing some training, some information, how do you get resources to those particular communities. And so finally, one of the things that we identified lastly, and we're, we're, we're working on this and really excited and we invite, invite anybody that like to be a, a part of this, is that we needed to have an ongoing military family advisory committee. And that committee would be made up of experts, military families, a few military youth, um, the government, and then also some agencies that work with military families and some public and private corporations. So one of the things that this group will be responsible for over the next year is taking the recommendations, putting them to action, and then also developing opportunities and resources. The corporations obviously will be there to help fund some of the system support that we have, but also making sure that everything that we identify and that we build up would be a program programs that would be specifically to meet the gaps in services for our military and our youth. And then also that it would be a way if, you know, as we're sort of building these programs that we can course correct next year. And again, this is an ongoing committee. The committee would be a part of our organization um, for military as long as they'd like to be a part of it. But this is a standing committee that we hope to have um, and enlist some of their expertise. So finally, you know, one of the things that, that as I wrap up, you know, and we think about some of the, the, the findings that we've had in working with our military families and, 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 and sort of hearing from them is that we have these grandiose ideas. You know, we bring these groups together and we have these delightful conversations. Um, we built this wonderful white paper that has lots of great information. And, and, and again, you can send me an email and I'll send you the actual white paper, which is, which is wonderful but we have to make sure that we take the information and we put it to action. And, and for Boys and Girls Clubs, and as long as I'm the National Vice President, that's what's going to happen. And, and, and as we work together, you know, working with organizations like um, the American Legion and, and partnerships that if we do that, and we do it with fidelity and we do it with a targeted approach that you know we can sort of stand in the gap to make sure that we meet the needs of these military families. We're seeing budget cuts and what's the first thing to get cut? 
is support to military families. And so we have a responsibility to those military families to make sure that if that does happen, that they do not, that it's invisible to them because we have organizations like Boys and Girls Clubs and partnerships that will stand in the gap and make sure that we continue to meet their needs. Thank you. Thank you so much for your, for your words, Terrell. If you'd stay here just a minute. If anyone has any questions, if you'd please go to the mics that are on either side. While they're doing that, um, I'd like to ask you a question. Okay. You've indicated that Boys and Girls Clubs of America operates on many military installations across the country. Could you suggest what type of help our military clubs could use from an auxiliary unit or member? Okay. You know, and I alluded to this as I was wrapping up, one of the things that we're finding is, particularly for our military youth centers, that they're, with budget cuts, you know, they're, they're for family programs, there are a lot of, of, of programs that are getting cut. And, and sadly, they're programs that our military youth and, and kids need. And so one of the things that's really important is obviously advocacy, um, that we advocate that, that we, we don't lose those type of programs, but also volunteering. You know, there is a lot of, I'm sure, expertise out in the room. And, and really, where those programs, and we're getting staff cuts, and we're getting you know cuts to programs, we really need partners like you to help come in and support those military kids. And who better to do it? You know, we, we if you have for mil the military community is a very unique environment, um, and and so to have individuals who understand that, working with those military and families, you know, we really just need more support from members like you to help support those military kids and families right in their communities. Okay. Hi, I'm Julie Kleszewski from New York State, uh, past first district president and legislative chair. I had two questions, okay. quick questions. We have a bill in the Senate right now that has not been passed, S257, uh, and it's called the uh, GI um, Tuition Fairness Bill. Uh, and. The other question I had, I would, I would like you to comment on your senators if they support this. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is, do you have a bill in your state that says that military and the veterans and their families are charged in-state tuition no matter what their residency? So we, let me just, so Boys and Girls Clubs is actually a national organization, and so our clubs that are in the, so we have them in 4,000 communities, so there's one in every oh. state. Um, we do have a government relations office who works with all states. Um, one of the things that our government relations office will do is advocate for those types of things. So we don't work specifically in a state. The national organization actually supports all those local organizations, mm -hmm. and our government relations office is on the hill all the time. Um, they are not necessarily support, supporting that individually, but what they are looking at is programs that support military families as a whole. Well, we, we've learned that uh, uh, military families particularly have a difficult time transitioning back into society. We found that, you know, college and uh, vocation problem, vocational programs are very important for their children right. and for the, for the veterans themselves. So one of the things that we do as Boys and Girls Clubs, and we've had an opportunity to do this, is we've worked with organizations like Marquette University and the University of Phoenix, where we provide full scholarships to military kids. Mm -hmm. We have a Military Youth of the Year program, um, oh, where good. we provide about $50,000 in scholarships to oh, military excellent. kids. So our organization itself provides those. We also have uh, three or four scholarships that we give a year to a parent. Yeah. Okay, well, I'd like to talk to you further about this later. Absolutely, please. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Martha Corrier from North Carolina. I know there are a lot of Boys and Girls Clubs in the um, areas where there's no military installations. Mm -hmm. Do all of the Boys and Girls Club implement the military, family, and children program? And if not, is it... Um, 
presumptuous of us to go in and introduce ourselves and say, we would like to assist if you have any military children that are in your program. I love that. That's wonderful. What, one of the things, we have a program, I think it's in your packet, it's called Mission Youth, great question, thank you, um, Mission Youth Outreach. And so we operate in about 1,000 of our clubs that are in local communities. So those programs would actually be programs that typically a military family would live. Um, and they do provide these programs that are specifically for military kids. Honestly, in the other environments, you know, we don't necessarily, they may not necessarily. So absolutely, you know, I, it would be really important, again, to go back to the question when you talk about volunteers, we really need to make sure that we're advocating, even with our local clubs. It says if you have a military kid, we need to make sure you're incorporating this type of environment. And we're working from our organization to do that. But, it, you know, if you guys can help us with that, absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do we want to go here? Okay. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Dorothy Walsh. I'm the director of the Homeless Veterans Initiative for the Department of Florida. I work with homeless veterans every day. The biggest reason that a homeless vet is homeless is because of PTSD and TBI. And a lot of the reason is because uh, the family does not want the returning soldier around in the home around the kids mm -hmm. in the family. Is there any type of initiative in the integration process that is, um, will help the children understand and how to deal with the fact that mommy and or daddy are not the same person they were when they left. Thank you, great question. And one of the things that with our resiliency and our reintegration and working with Dr. Kenneth Ginsburg and Dr. Merrick, that is a key part of the resiliency. That not only are we fam finding that, you know, parents who are suffering from PTSD, but we're seeing a large number of military kids who have never went to war um, having also some symptoms of PTSD. So that is a really big part of our resiliency and reintegration training, um, PTSD, health, wellness, family members coming back, who look the same but don't necessarily act the same. And so we do have those programs. We need to do a better job of getting that to all of our clubs, but not just our clubs, but to also any you know military families that don't have access to those clubs. So we're building an online version of that with Dr. Ginsburg that will actually have sort of that part of it as a framework and that families who never come to a Boys and Girls Clubs or never go to an installation can go online and have access to that. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for speaking. I'm Karen Baylor, Department of Colorado. Just a couple of observations. Okay. I served as principal of Kodiak High School, Kodiak, yeah. Alaska, yeah. which is home to the largest Coast Guard base in the world. Yes. Very, very interesting observations because I'd not been in that kind of position before. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say a couple big frustrations faced by our 3,000 military families. Mm -hmm. Number one, lack of a consistent curriculum. And I will tell you that those Coast Guard students, by and large, really came in well prepared and families repeatedly came to me frustrated mm -hmm. at the lack of consistency and the level of challenge. And so that's a huge one for Boys and Girls Club and all of us that's right. mm -hmm. to tackle. Um, I'm not a proponent of Common Core, mm -hmm. but we need to really focus on that to help our military children. The other thing I'd say is that, and I don't have data to prove this, but as I continued working with kids and families of our Coast Guard members, huge amount of children who are on prescription medication, antidepressants, mm -hmm. uh, ADD, anxiety medications, and I would encourage too that through some type of intervention, blogging, and the earlier the better, that we look away from those pharmaceutical treatments that could impact our, our people long term mm -hmm. and look for more interactive types of therapy to help our kids. Thank you. That great point. And you know, one of, the, yeah, please. 
And, and again, you know, one of the things as we look at this, and that's why I would invite anybody to be a part of this military, you know, the National Military Leadership Council that we're, we're convening together, is that we really have to think about those things. You know, Boys and Girls Clubs is an after-school program. You know, we've had an opportunity where we're sort of expanding our services, but we really need to make sure that we're working with mental health professionals, you know, bringing in Dr. Ginsburg, Dr. Merrick, and some others, because those are very real issues, not just for the Coast Guard. I mean, we're finding that we work with every branch of services, and it is alarming to go into these programs and see um, not only how our kids are doing. You know, we say they're resilient. We say they're strong. They are. But we have to be real about the expectations of what's happening to these military families. And a lot of them are so quick to give them prescriptions and so quick to give them, them drugs because that's easier. But we really have to make sure that we're advocating for programs that have alternative methods um, so that the kids, like you said, don't have these long-term effects. And, and again, you know, as we position ourselves with boys and girls, so we've recognized that, even from information with the Department of Defense, that we have to work with mental health professionals um, to make sure that we're building programs. It's great to talk about resiliency, but if you have a kid who's on you know, drugs that's been prescribed to them and they're zoning out, and that's how they're dealing, then the resiliency curriculum doesn't work. And so we really have to make sure when we talk about that we're integrating these approaches um, with, uh, with other programs. And we'll be doing in 2015 an opportunity where we're going to do that. We're bringing together mental health professionals. We're bringing together um, individuals who are working with veterans or uh, homeless so that when we do this great thing again, you know, really we'll be focused on expanding those opportunities to some other issues that are facing military families and youth. Thank you. I'm Pam Ray from the Department of Illinois. My question is very quick, but I'm questioning on the STEM program. Mm -hmm. I know that you were using veterans and military spouses for that program, but if you have a civilian, say, chemistry professor yep. that was looking to volunteer, who would she just go to the local Boys and Girls Club? She's in the Chicago area. So if you give them my contact information, mm -hmm. so again, the, the veterans are just a small portion of it. We are definitely looking for mm -hmm. experts in the field and working with corporations. So you, I think you have my information. I do. If you'll, have the, if you'll reach out to me, um, we, we can connect them. Wonderful. The, the one thing about sort of the, the organizations, and, and we sometimes have to make a call, you know how that works, yeah. to Illinois and say, hey, you're going to get this call, um, and we need to make sure that you make this happen. And so we need to advocate for that too. Okay? okay? Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you for bringing us such pertinent information. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank Here's you. my card. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. Let us turn our attention now to a typical military family to see how their experience compares to the research. Vivian Greentree is both a Navy veteran and a proud military spouse. She currently serves as Senior Vice President and Head of Military and Veteran Affairs at First Data Corporation. Before that, she helped to found Blue Star Families, where she helped create Blue Star Families Military Family Lifestyle Survey. This survey ex examines a broad spectrum of issues affecting modern day military families. Joining her today are her two sons, MJ and Walker. May I introduce Ms. Greentree and MJ and Walker. Hello. Well, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to preemptively separate them so that we don't have a fight break out on the stage. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for having us here today. Um, a little bit about ourselves. Oh. Is that, oh. okay. um, a little bit about ourselves. Um, I'm, I think she mentioned a Navy spouse and a Navy veteran, and um, hopefully the future uh, proud parent of a Marine and a Navy SEAL. Which you'll see, <laughs> yeah. Um, and it, it's interesting too, if I could take a little um, sideline for a minute, as part of our um, research with Blue Star Families and part of our uh, Military Family Lifestyle Survey, which some of you may have took and know that it, we ask you everything but your blood type. It's that long of a survey. Uh, because we want to know all the things that it takes for um, policy leaders and the military leadership to make decisions because they're going to make the decisions anyway. So what we wanted to do was quantify 
the military family lifestyle experience as if you could ever do that, but give them as much information as they could to make the best decisions um, about our families uh, that they could. And one of the great things that we found, um, in fact, we started to create an entire um, section about it was our civic health survey. Um, and what we found was that, and this is at the end of the survey, so as we asked all these things about their relationships, communications, deployments, financial, um, spouse employment, really asking them, th their children, um, and getting them to say all the things that they were concerned about. Then we said, do you think that the all volunteer service has worked? Would you recommend um, your service members staying in? Would you recommend service to a young person? And overwhelmingly, our respondents, all military families, said yes. Um, and that's why I love saying, you know, I'm a, I'm a Navy veteran, I'm a Navy spouse, and hopefully the proud future parent or the parent of a future Marine and a future SEAL. <laughs> Marine. Um, so um, this, the, the, we, we created this PowerPoint, the boys and I um, and Mike kind of put together some pictures. They encompass, I think, the last, um, we've been through five deployments as a family. Um, I think this one has been through four, this one maybe three, maybe three and a half-ish. Um, but so it's a, it's a lifestyle, we call it the, the new normal. I think the pictures that are coming up that you're going to be seeing are probably more recent. Um, but we thought we'd, we'd play them behind us as we spoke because um, he's already signed, so I'll, I'll, I'll fast forward. Um, but the best part about my job at Blue Star Families was that it allowed me to um, capture and put into a policy position our home life. That's why we started the organization, really, was to say, I can't, I can't have felt this alone, you know, when I was going against the school district because they didn't provide a service for my child because they were waiting us out. Or I don't know what to do when he's crying. Um, you know, is that normal to cry for a week straight after the beginning of a deployment? Or when, when do you start to worry and, how, and who do you reach out to? How do you reach out to them? Because it's very hard to admit during the early deployments that you need help. Um, after about the third, you're just desperate, so you're begging anyone. Um, but at the beginning, you can feel like you have to keep a stiff upper lip. Um, and so, uh, I put together a few things as a researcher. So this is what we know from the research. Uh, we know a few things. One, military families after, um, when I started using these stats, it was 11, 12, no, it's 13 years of war. Uh, we know that we're worried about our kids. Our, our Blue Star Families um, survey continues to show that military families are worried about the effects of deployment on our children um, and the effects of the military lifestyle on their ability to pursue education, which I think the first two speakers have um, spoken about. Um, we know that they cope better and that the negative impact of deployments can be mitigated against when they believe that their community, um, communities like yours, care and are vested in, in them and believe that what their parents are doing matters and, is, um, and, and that they're serving their country. And that, you know, that's an external influence. It's something that we can't, um, you can't legislate about and you can't control. So you, it's really um, having conferences like this and letting people speak about their personal um, experience that really mirror a lot of your own, I know. Um, the only thing now is we have smartphones um, <laughs> that are in our kids' pockets and they teach us how to use. Um, and we know, um, <laughs> which he snuck up on the stage, um, <laughs> just like a Marine. Um, but we know that they, the, like the most robust indicator across all of the literature in research is that um, children experience deployments through their at-home caregiver, whether it's their parent, whether it's their grandparent, in some cases a sibling, but they really experience the deployment cycle the way that their caretaker does. So if, if the parent is doing well, if they're coping, if they're developing resiliency, then the children can. And that's, um, I took that to heart. So that's what I know as a researcher. You know, so personally, as a mom, you know, and that's what the, that's, you know, what these pictures are. Um, this, this last deployment, I know that Mike missed two karate belt, um, what is it when you get a big, bigger one? Ranking. <laughs> Ranking. Um, we know that he saw one loose, one loose tooth on, on through Facebook. 
Um, but he missed one through FaceTime, which we were luckily to just catch as he snagged it. Um, he missed a, a year's worth of Cub Scout experience, which I'm going to um, read to you a little bit about <laughs> um, because uh, that was quite an experience being the mom of two different dens in a pack that loves to camp. Um, so, and then we all had, we had personal advances and we had personal setbacks that we all had um, that we all experienced separately. And so to come back after that, um, but then here's the good part. Um, and this is why, like I said, I, I hope my kids um, join the military someday and choose to serve in that way. Uh, we met amazing people and had amazing experiences. Like when we went to the hiring fair for my, for my job up in New York City and met Jack Jacobs. Now, how many 10-year-olds know who Jack <laughs> Jacobs is? And who, <laughs> oh, here's one right here. And who, who is Jack Jacobs? He was um, a Medal of Honor recipient. And, and General Shinseki, and he is the um, Secretary of, Secretary the, of um, the Veterans Affairs. Yeah. And I think that's in one of our pictures. Um, but I remember when, when, we, when we had the chance to meet him because they were, they were up there touring the, the hiring fair, MJ said, they, met, they take care of, Shinseki takes care of all the veterans in all of the country. And he was like, what an awesome job. <laughs> and I, you know, and, he, and there were some stars that were there that were there to promote uh, various things. And I, all, he, all he cared about was, and there's the picture um, coming up. But we went to Atlanta, we went to New York, we went to Wolf Lodge, we went to Myrtle Beach, the, <laughs> where, where they learned to talk uh, Southern, like, <laughs> like their mom who grew up in Atlanta. We went to Disney, um, where someone got to thank someone that he'll talk about in a second. Um, and we did a zombie run. Oh, that, was uh, fun. that was fun. And yeah. uh, we even had tea at the Willard. Um, <laughs> and so I, I'd like to think that what we what we've done is show them um, that they can thrive and that they are actually blessed in a way that only 1% of the population is, and that's to be um, affiliated with someone in the military and to know what that means. There are lots of different ways to serve, um, but that you know, their dad has chosen to serve in a particular way, which means that they have to serve in a particular way because they're along for the ride. Um, and so I think, MJ, if you want to tell us a little bit about what what your favorite memory of being a military kid is? Um, my favorite memory is when we went to the hiring fair and we built care packages two days before my dad left, not for r, &R but at the end of r, r So I was hoping one would get to him. And then what did we do later? Oh yeah, we had a kid concert and um, I got interviewed and I accidentally, I called my dad the um, commander in chief <laughs> when, 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 I'm, I want to make him seem cooler, not that he's not awesome, just make him awesomer. <laughs> <laughs> he loved that, right? Her <laughs> dad's like a major achievement. That was fun when we got home that night. Um, and then Walker, do you want to tell us what your favorite memory of being a military kid is? Oh, sure. <laughs> When I wrote a letter to Admiral McRaven, and he write, he wrote it me back, and then he gave me a coin. Oh. And why why did you? This is and this is what you do in a military family. You know who to write. <laughs> why did why did you write him? Because I didn't know who was quieter, ninjas or Navy SEALs. <laughs> yes. And he, he did say that um, ninjas might be quieter, but seals were definitely cooler, which I think we, we, we agree with. And then um, the other thing we did, because we were really trying to humanize this um, with our crazy pictures, um, but also I went through, and I think one of the reasons why, um, and we worked with ALA, actually uh, Blue Star Families is, a, is we are very lucky to be a grantee and have one of um, a VISTA. We've had a continuous VISTA which has um, provided for some of the programs, like the one where MJ is standing in front of um, General Powell. And he, it was really funny, I mean, that was part of our Blue Star Museums event. Um, and he was really funny because when he, when he was standing in front of him, he said, I want to make very clear um, that I respect General Powell and, and, and the Army, but I, I still want to be in the Navy. 
<laughs> which you went over very, very well. Um, but we, we shared this entire experience through my Facebook page because it's the easiest way. It's the only reason my husband's on Facebook. Um, it's the reason my mom got on Facebook, his, his mom. And so, um, and really to seek, honestly, support, information, resources, the quickest way is to crowdsource it. So um, here's some of the posts. I just wanted to, I, we picked out some of the ones we thought were funny or, or poignant. Mm -hmm. um, and here's one that MJ will read that, uh, wa about Walker. Um, Walker went to school one day and he came back with something. This is what it reads. Walker couldn't wait till tomorrow to read his father's dead letter to Mike. It reads, Dear Daddy, thank you for protecting the world. Thank you for sharing your bravery with me when I got a shot. Thank you for everything you do for me. I dream about you every day. Love, Walker Grinch. With Michael <laughs> Greentree. With Walker Greentree, because otherwise you <laughs> might not know. But those are the, um, that's, you know, that's. <laughs> <laughs> so sweet boy. Um, and so that happened when, uh, of course, Mike deployed, and the week later, Walker had the flu um, or pneumonia, and then was in the hospital and had to get a shot. And he said, "You know, I wish I had Dad's bravery with me." You know, and everybody in the room is <laughs> breaking out and you're trying to be brave, and and he was the bravest one there. Um, and then the, to the more you know funny ones, uh, this one's back in August when we, he had just come home from R and R and then was just about to to leave again. Do you want to read it? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Stop me when you heard this one. Picture last day of R and R, Mike to me. When are you going to start being mean to me to help me through the long goodbye? Me. When are you going to help? to start saying stupid things to me. Wait, is it starting now then? <laughs> <laughs> that so that's, uh, we're just keeping it real. This is how it happens. <laughs> and then it gets, you know, these are, these are the other things that you deal with. Um, in, on September 16th, which was when the Navy, um, the Navy Yard shootings happened, um, I posted, um, thank you for our wonderful friends who are checking in on us. Mike isn't going to be at the Navy Yard until he gets back from deployment. He was not there today. He's safe and we are safe. I'm very thankful for our family's safety, but heartbroken for those who lost a loved one today. And so that's, you know, the, the things that you don't think will happen, but those are from people that know us and knew he was going to the Navy Yard and were reaching out, um, actually before I had even seen the news, and it, you know, it's humbling to know that people care, um, but it also is a reminder that you could just go into work one day um, and have something catastrophic happen. Um, and then to, um, so because of, because of Walker's uh, letter to, to Admiral McRaven, there was a lot of um, interest in, in what would make a child <laughs> ask uh, the head of SOCOM. Um, who's quieter, a seal or a ninja, and that's just what we do because we know who to ask those type of serious questions to. And so um, as the interest grew and um, we had, someone wanted to come do an interview with him, he woke up with hives <laughs> all over his little body. Um, and so this post was, just to keep it real, Walker woke up with a case of the hives and was 30, minute in, 30 minutes into a dose of Benadryl when he spoke with Good Morning America. And the water damage on the top floor ceiling I noticed last night and messaged Mike about has him on full alert and sending me companies to call to come check it out. But first he had to FaceTime with me to make me go stand across the street in our neighbor's driveway to show him our roof and to see if it's missing any shingles, which I wouldn't even know if it was until the water came through. Um, and then he asked how I didn't notice it earlier, to which um, my friend Jen, as I was mentioning with her, said, clearly you don't spend as much time staring up at the ceiling when Mike isn't home. <laughs> ba -dum -bum. So uh, there's, and we got that, we got that ceiling fixed. We did get that ceiling fixed. Um, not till he got back though. We fixed the problem, we didn't fix the, we didn't fix the roof though. Um, and then this one coming, this is the Boy Scouts now. So MJ, what, what level are you? I am Weeblo One. And what level are you? Tiger. Yeah. Which means that we sell a lot of popcorn and have gotten five ticks. 
five, four, five ticks. Five. Yeah. We bring them home with us. Yes. Mm -hmm. I wish oh, that they were Girl Scouts. Four, 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 four. 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 Um, four. Mm. So um, this was this was about the breaking point. This was when I think um, this was ahead of the Pinewood Derby, which we knew would, um, which I found out would be days before Mike came home from deployment, meaning that I would have to make the cars and then race the cars with them. So this was, um, this was me on November 24th. This is our, <laughs> and this one still gets me. This is our family's fifth deployment. I have started a master's degree program while on active duty with a baby and a deployed husband. I have driven from Texas to Virginia with a five-year-old while breastfeeding mm. and started and completed a PhD program with two kids under the age of four and missed two more deployments. I navigated speech and occupational therapy for this one in a hostile school system and picked out jock straps for both of them with <laughs> nary a giggle. I have changed filters and chased after, admittedly after initially running from the captured mice, thank you MJ for helping, and attended more holiday parties and weddings alone than is fair, and helped to create an organization that has grown from five unpaid women to over 20 paid staff, uh, with a membership of over 60,000 and a hand at influencing national policy. If you wonder why I am recounting what I consider these to be personal feats of amazement, it's because today I have to remind myself what I'm capable of because none of these things have broken me, but what is going to drive me screaming into an oblivion will be the Boy Scouts of America. <laughs> they, they, that seemingly innocuous outfit of campers, popcorn pushers, and Pinewood Derby aficionados, and their never-ending requirements for badges and achievements, and we, I call them things one and two because of the Dr. Seuss book, and they are like things one and two, which the ladies backstage can attest to as they were disassembling things. Uh, because things one and two continue to strive ever towards in their quest to become Eagle Scouts, the badges and achievements, it's going to be the thing, all caps, that breaks me. Like a kid cat. And then, now excuse me, I have to go monitor thing two. I'm teaching him how to operate the coffee maker for his small appliance knowledge badge. <laughs> so that was that was November. Yeah, right. Let's give because we none of us broke. No, and we did get the badges. We did get the badges. So that's November. Um, but these and I was trying to go back see what a picture. That's the the um, the tie the Father's Day letter that that Walker wrote that we framed. And at the bottom it actually says Walker's third um, third deployment. And at the top is when. Um, MJ went on to talk about being a military kid. Uh, the middle is when, what was the name of that band we were gonna start? Kitchen Crashers. A lot of these, if they seem out of focus, it's because we're FaceTiming with Mike and just trying to show him um, what's going on at home and that everybody's alive and it's not Lord of the Flies yet. <laughs> um, although it could, it could be sometimes. And there's the, the future Marine hat um, and the future SEAL hat. And then this one, um, you know, when you, yes, you can use it. When you get, really, you want to get everything out that's broken or lost or missing uh, before they come home. So this was one of the posts right before I wanted to do it in public so that he could get over it before he got home. So now that we are in final countdown mode for homecoming, I have a few things I want Michael Greentree to know before he gets home just to, you know, let him get over these travel itty bitty home front details starting with deep breathing i lost one of the precious prius keys so i think one of them lost I, this key I just i think you did it i didn't <laughs> i started you it's probably thing one two <laughs> i started using your cufflinks and i didn't want to give them back several of the little door not hitting wall things <laughs> have fallen off. Again, I think the things had a hand in that. I did not do it. To <laughs> no, no one ever does anything, but somehow okay. everything nope. happens. Nope, nope, nope. <laughs> nope. Yes. A little tiny elf came in and did it. <laughs> Even when I glued, yes, glued them back on the Apple Time machine, hasn't worked since sometimes before Thanksgiving. And no, that list wasn't exclusive. 
there will be more tomorrow. Phew, <laughs> I feel so much lighter. <laughs> That's good. So, <laughs> yeah. so that, I hope, gave a little bit in a very condensed time uh, what it was like for us, um, you know, through our five deployments, couple of moves. Uh, but, but again, at the end of the day, being a military family has enriched and enlarged our lives in ways we could not have possibly fathomed 11 years ago when I got into this. And so, um, you know, we're here for questions if you, if you have any. And if not, thank you so much for allowing us to come and share our story with you. So, Bart, MJ, and Walker, incredible. <laughs> and so is Mom. You've done an amazing job, and thank you. Thank you for your service. And we want to thank, of course, Mike for his service as well. And I will tell you that yesterday was a pretty special day for MJ. It was his 10th birthday. So I think we need to sing happy birthday to MJ in a really great American Legion auxiliary way. So let's sing happy birthday. Happy birthday. So I saw that really cool coin you have. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Well, would, I'd like to give you my national president's coin. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, MJ. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for everything. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd love to do questions, but we are running really um, late, so we need to kind of move on. And but thank you for everything you do. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. We thank them so much for sharing their experiences with us, and we also thank the Walker family for their family service. Ladies, I hope this session has uh, shed a light on the need of support for our nation's military children. Um, they certainly will always, as long as we have a military, will always need our support. Please review and implement some of the suggested activities within the National Children and Youth Plan of Action. I look forward to sharing your impact numbers and telling your children and youth stories at National Convention this year. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. I have asked Janet Jefford to moderate our next session, which focuses on military and veteran caregiving. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. That's going to be a hard act to follow. <laughs> All right, our second session this morning focuses on the current landscape of military and veteran caregiving. Our presenters this morning will provide a look at our long-term responsibility ahead to care for those who served in our military and for their caregivers too. Also, we will have a first-hand account of caring for a seriously injured veteran. I am pleased to introduce to you Nancy Weaver, she is the Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, Warrior Care Policy. In this position, Nancy serves as the focal point for interaction with the services on policy and issues affected wounding, wounded, ill, and injured care coordination for active, reserve, and guard personnel. She also formulates Department of Defense strategic plans, programmatic objectives, policies and standards to improve managed care, services, and benefits for the transition of recovering service members and their families. Please welcome Nancy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. 
you know, I hesitated to come out here. That was a hard act to follow, so <laughs> be gentle with your questions. <laughs> you know, I'm a retired active duty and a now a civilian, and I've got to tell you, I've got one of the best jobs in DOD, and that is helping take care of our wounded warriors. Uh, wounded, ill, and injured, because after we leave Afghanistan, we'll still have injured and ill service members that we need to take care of. What we hope to do is take our lessons learned from the last 12 years and put those in policy so that our wounded, ill, and injured will never be forgotten. And when we talk about wounded, ill, and injured, we have to talk about the caregiver. For military members, that caregiver in the largest percent of the time is a, an immediate family member, a mother, father, or grandparents. Uh, next slide, please. We have quite a few programs, but I'm going to focus on these, and, and since we're behind, I'm going to move through very quickly. Uh, could I have next slide? When we talk about our wounded, ill, and injured, we talk about recovery, rehabilitation, and transition. When we're in the recovery stage for the caregiver, one of the most important things is to ensure that caregiver can help navigate the medical system. The managed care puts a plan together that, that consists of sometimes two, as many as 17 clinical specialists to help in the recovery of a service member. It's important that the caregiver understand what the end result of all of these efforts will be and help communicate those plans as they move from goal to goal in timeline to timeline. Can I have next slide? TRICARE has got several benefits that talk about and address respite care, which is very important. Respite care for the uh, extended care provides 16 hours of uh, opportunity for the caregiver to uh, get some rest while a skilled uh, care worker takes care of the individual. For more complex cases with the home care benefit, they come in, a skilled worker comes in for an individual family member who needs 40 hours, five days a week, eight hours a day, cannot be consecutive care. This provides an opportunity for a lot of times for the caregiver to get the needed sleep and rest that uh, they need in order not to break down their health. Now another benefit TRICARE has is for a caregiver who's caring for an active duty member. They also can get 40 hours of rest, five days a week, eight hours per day, and this is for an individual that usually would need two or more interventions by a skilled uh, healthcare provider. This allows the worker to or caregiver to get the needed rest, usually at night, but does not necessarily have to be. These benefits, as well as all other benefits offered under the military health system, can be found at tricare.mil, because no matter what, you need the information when you need it, and it changes often. This is an award-winning site that just received the best in government and the best in public sector. Uh, it is for members and caregivers and changes often. So we encourage the caregiver to go out and look at the site and become familiar with it so that they can navigate it. Could I have the next slide, please? Uh, early in 2005, all the way through 2013, we've been holding focus groups with our caregivers to find out what information they needed, what gap were we not filling. And they've come back and told us that they need a repository of sites or information that they can go to. We've put out the caregiver resource directory, which is a paper copy filled with 
mostly government sites, uh, organizations, and benefits that they can go to. As of the end of February, we had distributed 30,000. We just in, uh, printed 10,000 more. And at the end of April, we'll provide a 2014 guide. Although this is mostly paper, you can download this on our national resource directory, which is nrd.gov. This is a site that's open to everyone. It has over 100 subscribers. It also received almost 300 hits at the end of February, and it looks like we're going to exceed that for the month of March. This offers a uh, 15 uh, pages that the caregiver can go to. It offers almost 10,000 resources that are available at the national, local, and state level that caregivers and members can go to for information or help depending on their situation. For 2014, we're looking at training opportunities. We've partnered with several organizations to provide training that caregivers have told us they needed. And on warriorcare.gov, we offer pamphlets and uh, resource guides that can be downloaded that are informational and are changing depending on what our caregivers tell us they need. One area that we're aggressively pursuing is peer-to-peer -peer conversations. It's very important that the caregivers have an opportunity to interact with other caregivers. They can trade experiences, lessons learned, and offer an opportunity to pass on information to a new caregiver from a caregiver that's been provided care for quite a while. This one-on-one -on -one contact is key it is something that uh, caregivers have told us they've needed, and we're trying to respond uh, both through uh, internet and uh, webinars as well as in person. One thing that we're aggressively going out and working with TRICARE is to make sure that the caregiver takes care of themselves. This is vitally important because, as you know, the caregiver's health has, uh, has got to be at its maximum. We encourage caregivers to take the time to do those things that ensure that they stay healthy. And this is spread throughout all of our websites as well as all the training that's provided. Could I have the next slide, please? Other resources. Uh, we work with Coast Guard, uh, Warrior Care Policy is, of course, our office, and we're always seeking see feedback from our caregivers to tell us what they need. Two programs that I want to specifically highlight is the Yellow Ribbon Program, which focuses on Guard and Reserve as they transition from deployment back into their communities. These programs under Yellow Ribbon uh, matches the resources in the local communities with the deployed individuals that they can start looking at what resources they need and we encourage caregivers and family members to participate in the seminars that we give. The uh, Center of Excellence for Psychological Health and Traumatic Brain Injury is uh, leading the nation in the prevention and care of TBI. And website, uh, tricare.mil, uh, provides the latest info on how to prevent traumatic brain injury as well as how to care for someone who has traumatic brain injury. Could I have the next slide? To help alleviate the financial strain of caregivers, we have several programs. This, uh, this one is affectionately called SCADL. It is for uh, the individual member uh, gets a stipend to pay a caregiver, which most of the time is a family member, to take care of the needs that uh, the individual needs until they uh, recover or move to veteran status. 
Most of the people who qualify for SCADL move from active duty straight into veteran uh, status and they usually qualify for veteran help too. There's two differences between this program as well as the, the Veterans Administration program. Our program is for wounded, ill, and injured, whereas the veteran program is just for the wounded. And this stipend is play, paid to the individual, whereas the veteran program pays directly to the caregiver. We are working with Congress to see if we can get ours uh, paid to the caregiver. Um, Although it's often given to a family member, if it isn't, then the individual um, member, active duty member, has to pay taxes on it because it does increase their income. We feel that it's pay that the caregiver needs and that the caregiver should, should receive and not the individual member. Next. The uh, expanded travel authority for family members has become uh, a lifeline. During the initial days when a member is in the hospital, it is very important that they have loved ones with them. This program allows up to three family members to travel to the bedside of the individual and be with them during the initial stages on through when a uh, case management plan can be put together. Uh, the individual can come, uh, varying members can come, and it's once every 60 days for inpatient members only. Once they leave and become outpatient, it's sometimes important for them to have an individual who travels with them so that they can make their medical appointments either at a military treatment center or at a VA hospital. The next program allows a non-medical personnel, usually a family member, to travel with them to make these medical appointments. The first one's for inpatient, the second one is for outpatient. Okay, next. Military community and family policy helps and coordinates the activities that are on the base to ensure the caregiver, regardless of the level that the wounded, ill, and injured service member has, has the support that they need. And there's a couple of programs that the Warrior Care Policy Office has partnered with to provide immediate uh, information to the caregiver. One is the Family Network Learning Network. This is a uh, collaboration with the USDA that provides webinars for the caregiver. We've had two already. We've got one scheduled for the month of April, and it is interactive with the caregivers where we have experts to talk to them about any issues that they feel that they would like some information on. These webinars also can be uh, downloaded and reviewed at a later date if the caregiver is not available to participate in the webinar when it happens. These are advertised on the TRICARE, the NRD, and the uh, base websites and the Wounded Warrior websites to help get the information out. Military One Source offers 24 hours, seven a days a week contact with the caregiver and the family member. And we've set up special programs that if a warrior who is wounded, ill, or injured, or their caregiver needs immediate information, they can contact through the 1-800 number and a counselor will get back with them within 72 hours with the information they need. Let me stress, 
that this is not for the individual who is in distress. This is for general questions that they might have and not know who to call. They can call this 1-800 number and then the counselor will respond to their question and put them in with the individual that they need to make sure that not only this question but future questions are answered and they have a contact that they can go to. In order to respond to the peer-to-peer uh, interaction that uh, caregivers have told us they've needed. We have expanded online capability through Twitter and Facebook, which uh, has been an overwhelming success. We've also offered learning modules to allow the caregiver to gain a little bit more proficiency and become a little bit more confident in what they're doing and how they're doing and 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 want to do, and these have been very popular, and we usually pick the content and uh, how the medium works based on the feedback from the caregiver. Next slide, please. Ensuring that our members make a smooth transition from active duty to uh, veteran status is of vital importance to us, uh, particularly for those members who require complex care. We've partnered with VA to establish one policy, one mission, one plan. With an MOU, we have gotten uh, almost signed, should be signed within the next couple of weeks. It will provide overarching similar policies for the development of uh, integrated care plans so that an individual who starts out in the military active duty can roll smoothly into the VA and their plan not have to be redone or reaccomplished. We've also ensured that we're using the same terminology, which is uh, very important. Even though we are part of the federal government, we have two different languages uh, between the uh, DOD and the VA. This helps all caregivers and all family members and all individuals, both clinical and non-clinical, who interact with the plan know exactly what is being done, what the end goals are, and what their role is as they move from recovery, rehabilitation, and integration back into the civilian community. Uh, common checklists are used so that those that are completed in active duty, there's notes put in and it flows directly to the VA. And we've got a website, a SharePoint drive, that everything is posted and once the member gives permission and they know they're leaving active duty and moving to veteran status, their record can be viewed by their care manager in the VA so that that transition can start as soon as possible. Next slide, please. Service programs, all service programs have the same support. They're only done within the culture of the service uh, and the member uh, be, is very comfortable in that culture as well as the family member and the caregiver. Uh, the family support centers offer care to those individuals of the general population as well as wounded, ill, and injured that do not qualify or are not eligible for the warrior care program. They may have minor injuries or they have recovered but still need some help, but it's not severe. It's simple case management. Uh, so those programs are available so that we ensure we've got the full spectrum of our members taken care of. These programs are absolutely vital that we do in conjunction with the caregiver so that the caregiver is comfortable with what the member is going through and they can help the member achieve the goals that they would like to achieve. We uh, often do focus groups to make sure our caregivers provide us the information that we need in order to evaluate our programs to see what's working, 
and what needs to be changed, and this is an ongoing process. Next slide. So that's our warrior care emblem, and I thank you very much. And uh, you've got an aggressive schedule with some absolutely great speakers. I kind of wished I was here instead of going back to the Pentagon. <laughs> so thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, I have a question for you. What are one of the ways that the American Legion Auxiliary could help in, with um, our veterans and military caregivers? Well, I think there's a number of ways. One is understanding the program and knowing the sites that uh, are available so that you can recommend those sites. For anyone who would like a directory, we would be more than happy to supply those and, and you have our contact, we can send those out. Uh, become familiar with tracker.com mill and uh, nrd.gov and if you know of an organization that can help then you can add that organization to the website once we vet that organization to make sure it's credible we'll be more than happy to host them on our website thank you thank you thank you Nancy has to get back, so we will proceed. Okay. It is now my great privilege to be able to introduce to you the work of the Elizabeth Dole Foundation, which Senator Elizabeth Dole, who, uh, who is also a member of the American Legion Auxiliary, has founded. This foundation aims to uplift American military caregivers by strengthening the services afforded to them through innovation, evidence-based research, and collaborations. Joining us this morning to tell us more about the Elizabeth Dole Foundation is the foundation's executive director, Carol Lindemood Harlow. In this role, she focuses on building the foundation's capacity to support the military and veteran caregiver cause. Carol has also served as Assistant Vice Chancellor of Pepperdine University School of Law and Chief Development Officer for the National Museum of the United States Army Campaign. Please give a warm American Legion Auxiliary welcome to Carol. Good morning. Thank you, very <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting me here today to talk about the Elizabeth Dole Foundation. I am especially happy to be here today because I am a member of the Kenneth Nash Post-8 American Legion Auxiliary Unit here. <laughs> now, I know you're running behind, so I promise to be very brief. But our foundation was so pleased when it learned that the auxiliary was thinking about how it can make a meaningful difference in the lives of our military and veteran caregivers. And so in anticipation of our two organizations finding a great synergy of missions, I wanted to come here today and just talk a little bit about the foundation and where we see ourselves going. One of the first steps taken by the foundation when it was created in 2012 was to commission a study by the RAND Corporation. It was to be the first nationwide comprehensive look at America's military and veteran caregivers, their challenges, the resources available to them, and the support that they still need. We determined early on that the work of the foundation must be based on these need-based evidence because we couldn't afford to guess at the solutions when the stakes were so high we had to make sure we got it right. The study was conducted in two phases. The first was released last year and it analyzed the existing research and it showed us that we had really only scratched the surface of the problem. The second phase of the study aims to answer many of the outstanding questions. The results of the phase will be made public on April 1st at 11 a.m. So please mark it on your calendars. I invite all of you to visit our website at that time and you can link to a full report and then we're going to ask if you could share that with your social media networks so that we can help generate some much needed awareness. 
The report's release will be the first event of the Foundation's commemoration of April as the month of the military caregiver. This year, we'll celebrate the month with the launch of a national coalition of public, private, nonprofit, and faith communities, all committed to filling the gaps of our nation's support to military and veteran caregivers. Senator Dole has spent the last year personally meeting with corporations, members of Congress, the White House, and committed veteran service organization to discuss how we can each play a role in addressing the societal issue with a meaningful and effective national response. Now, although the RAND study will provide us with a stronger understanding of where our caregivers need help, there is nothing stopping us from helping caregivers in our own communities today. Please, I encourage you to visit our website. It is elizabethdolefoundation.org. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And I hope you'll sign up to receive updates about our coalition and suggestions about how you can assist caregivers in your own areas. With your help and the help of organizations and individuals across our nation, we can make a true difference in the lives of these hidden heroes. So thank you very much. I now have the privilege of introducing Major Kevin Polosky. But before I bring Kevin on stage, I think it's important to note that regardless of the extra challenges that these caregivers face day in and day out, their lives are not defined by the injuries of their loved ones. These men and women are inspirational, they're hardworking, and they are down to earth and very much full of hope. And Kevin is a perfect example of this. He has served in the United States Army on active duty for the past 16 years, and he currently serves as the executive officer to the Director for Logistics of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, J4. He has deployed to Kosovo, Iraq, Kuwait, Afghanistan for a combined total of more than three years. He was selected as the first one of our first fellows in 2012, and he has been a wonderful advocate for military and veteran caregivers. He and his beautiful wife, Christina, a veteran, are always willing to share their personal stories so that others may learn from this very important issue. Please join me in giving Major Kevin Polosky a very warm welcome. Okay. All right, so I don't have slides, I don't have notes, but I have a story. Uh, it's my story, and it's my wife's story, and it's my family's story. Uh, so I'm going to try to share that with you today. I was, had the honor of getting to see uh, Senator Elizabeth Dole and Lisa Gibbons give, receive awards about a year ago. And I had never met um, Lisa Gibbons before, but she had made a point that I thought was very unique and very poignant when it comes to us, is as a military caregiver, as a caregiver in general, it's not a badge of honor because it comes with a price, and that price is somebody's health. And so when you see wounded warriors come back, they come back with a badge of honor because they served their country and they were injured in the line of service for their country. And when you are that caregiver, you don't like to share your story because there's sadness in your story, because your story revolves around illness and your story revolves around injury. Um, and so I think it's interesting that when people always wonder why the caregiver story doesn't get told, because it's not a fun story to tell. Uh, it's a difficult story to tell for many of us, for, for myself and for others around us. Um, I will tell you that I did not even know I was a military caregiver until I got invited to join the Elizabeth Dole Foundation. I was a husband. I was a father. Um, I did what I figured anybody would do when, when their loved one comes back. You just take care of them, because that's just kind of the way I was raised. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about my story, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what I think, um, how you guys maybe can help, and then um, some advice I have for you if there's any caregivers out here. So um, I met my current wife in 2002. Um, we were both in the Army, both in school. We were in a group of about 10 or 15 people. We were all really good friends. Uh, she deployed to Iraq in 2003. I was in Fort Hood, Texas. Uh, I found out I was going to Iraq. We started communicating. She came back. I went to Iraq. We kept communicating. Um, we were friends for probably three years. By the time I got back, she got back. Um, we drove cross country and on the way from Fort Hood, Texas to uh, Barstow, California, we stopped in Las Vegas and got married at 
the Graceland Chapel of Love by six foot eight Elvis Presley. Uh, so I will tell you that sometimes Elvis marriages do last, so that's a good thing. Um, went to NTC, and NTC was a very interesting time because I would probably argue that my wife was my caregiver at NTC. I had some issues coming back from Iraq. I had some trouble kind of getting back into society. Um, was not the easiest person to live with, and so I think she kind of felt that pain. I had two brand new stepchildren, well, three at the time. So I had a 10-year-old child, I had a six-year-old and a three-year-old that didn't know me. Uh, and here I come back from Iraq, and it was just kind of a difficult time. So uh, we got through that time together, went to Fort Campbell, Kentucky, uh, where I got deployed, she got deployed. So we were deployed together for about three months. And what happened was my wife became allergic to something, and she didn't know what it was. So they took her to the clinic, gave her some Benadryl, and it was fine. Uh, two weeks later, she became allergic to something else. Uh, it was a little bit worse. They had to uh, give her some shots and stuff, uh, told her to watch what she eat, told her to watch where she was at, what she was doing, um, and we said, okay. And then about another three weeks later, this was June of 2008, I was in my office and someone came and told me, they said, hey, your wife's sick. And I was like, oh, here we go again, what's going on with her? And I went downstairs and she was, um, she was turning the corner and I saw her, and I'd never seen her like that before and I got really scared. And so I said, are you okay? And she said, I can't see you. And I said, what do you mean you can't see me? And she says, I can't see. And at that point, I was like, what the hell's going on? So um, I kind of grabbed, I said, here, I'll take you to the dock. And as we were going, um, she collapsed. And so I spent about six long minutes trying to keep her breathing while I was trying to get help to come. Um, so help finally came. They sent her um, to the dock. The dock pumped her full of whatever it was. They put her on a medevac plane that night, sent her back through launch tool. She came back to Fort Campbell, and we were trying to figure out what was wrong with her. We figured once we get her out of the area, everything's going to be fine. Uh, whatever she was allergic to is over there. She comes back, and, and we'll continue to live our normal life. So I stayed in Afghanistan, uh, and my wife began working in Rear D at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. So as months and, at this point, years go on, we found out that she wasn't getting better. In fact, she was getting worse, and it didn't make sense. And I will tell you to this day, I couldn't tell you what's wrong with her. I can give you a bunch of diagnoses. I can tell you that she has colonorgicaria. I can tell you she has fibromyalgia. I can tell you that she has rheumatoid arthritis. I can tell you that she has asthma, severe bronchitis. I can tell you that she has psoriasis of the hands and feet. Um, I can tell you that she suffers from de depression, severe depression um, at times. But what I, what I can tell you is that in 2007, she was running half marathons and she was the most active person you ever meet in your life. And today, if you saw her, she, she's probably in bed right now. In fact, I'm sure she's in bed right now. Um, she has a lot, of a lot of problems getting out of bed. She has a lot of problems getting around. Um, and she doesn't know what's wrong with her. And I'm not sure anybody really knows what's wrong with her. I know that she was healthy, she went, she got sick, and she came back. So my wife is in a difficult position because she suffers from what we call invisible wounds. So if you were to meet my wife, you would not know. If, she, if you met her on a good day, you would probably not know that she's even sick. Uh, she can talk to you. She's what we refer in the community as a walkie-talkie. So she can talk. She can laugh. She can smile. She can have great days. And then on the flip side, she'll spend five minutes with you, and then she'll spend the next three days in bed. And in her mind, she's not injured. In her mind, in her mind she quit because... She thinks of injuries as people coming back missing a limb. She thinks of injuries as people coming back with shrapnel wounds or who are blind. And you meet these incredible heroes who come back. And you see these commercials and Paralympians. And those people are amazing people. And there's, I would never take anything away from them. But there are also amazing people like my wife who have a story to tell. But it's a very difficult one to tell because she can't explain to you what's wrong with her. Um, so what that does is when you talk about depression, Depression is a serious thing, and, and when we're in the caregiver community, we talk a lot about PTSD, we talk a lot about TBI, and those are incredible things, um, but depression is very real. And in, in my wife's life, the depression, I think of it as a circular. So she wakes up, she doesn't feel good, she stays in bed because her body hurts. She's now sad because she has to stay in bed and she can't help me, she can't help the kids. Because she's sad, she stays in bed. Because she stays in bed, she gets sadder, and it just goes and it goes and it goes. And we see it coming, and we just can't avoid it sometimes. Um, and we don't know how to get out of it sometimes. So that's kind of how I got to where I am as a military caregiver. 
And that's kind of a little bit about my wife. And I'm very lucky and I'm very thankful that my wife allows me to share that story um, because I know a lot of people won't. And she sees that there's a potential for other people like her who are out there. And this is why I do what I do. Um, and I come and I talk to people like you whenever I can because there's a huge group of people that are like my wife. There's sons, daughters, husbands, wives that are coming back from these wars. And we don't necessarily know what's wrong with them, but they're not the same people that they were. And I need people to know that if that's what your spouse or your husband or your son, if that's their problem, then you're a military caregiver. Then you're taking care of a loved one, and you need to let people take care of you as well. I can remember when I was in Iraq in 2004, I was at a fob called Fob Falcon. It was in the uh, southwestern corner of Baghdad. When we first got there, we got attacked a lot by rockets and mortars. Um, and so we used to always hear that these bigger fobs that were kind of further out had like celebrities come. They had Toby Keith come and we had, you know, all these different celebrities kept thinking, oh man, if, you know, this stinks. We never get any of these guys come to our little fob. And then one day these posters came up in our fob and they said the Hope and Freedom Tour. And it had, I, it had like a country music guy and I think a comedian or something like that. But just the fact that someone was coming to our fob, I thought was going to be awesome. And so we're all excited. We're like, oh man, we get to see this. This is going to be cool. And then like two days before it was supposed to come, we got a bunch of mortars and a bunch of rockets. And I'll never forget that we woke up the next day and they had put giant, instead of taking the signs down, they put canceled signs on it. But they put canceled over the word tour. So everywhere you went, you just saw a sign that said, hope and freedom has been canceled. <laughs> and so, and I, I tell you that story because when you first find out that your loved one is sick and that your loved one's not gonna get better, you feel that way. You feel like your hope and freedom has been canceled. Um, so what I want to do real quickly for the next about five minutes is kind of talk to you about three things. I'm going to talk to you about um, what changed in me to become what I would hope to be as a better military caregiver, my advice I'd give to other caregivers, and then um, my advice I'd give to people that want to help caregivers because it's not easy. So what changed in me? Um, I wasn't a very good military caregiver for a long time. I probably, my wife would argue that I'm not a lot of times now. Um, what changed in me was I had to come to grips with it. Um, I used to get really mad at my wife for being sick, and that's pretty selfish. Uh, it's not good, but it's real, but it's a human emotion because I had a plan for my life. We were going to run marathons together. We were going to play golf together. We were going to run off in the sunset. I'm a very active person. She was a very active person. You know, and now she can't be outside for more than 30, 45 minutes at a pop. So I was really mad at her, and it wasn't fair. Um, and I had to come to grips with that. How I come to grips with that, for me, it was through faith, uh, through my faith in God to know that God put me here for a reason, and then I'm going to fulfill his plan, whatever his plan for me is. Um, I spent a lot of time not listening to him, and so when I started listening to him, my life got a lot better. Um, I had to stop being angry at her. I had to stop being angry at life. I had to stop being angry at the army. I had to stop being angry at everything because I was, because I just got, I just felt like this whole world was against me and I wanted to lash out at the world because it's not fair because I, here I am sacrificing my life and then it just kind of felt like it got dumped on me all of a sudden. Um, and I had to get over that. I had to stop feeling sorry for myself. And I will tell you, one thing that really helped, and you'll hear people talk about this a lot, was I had to find other people like me, because I, I didn't know I existed. Um, I was just a guy, like I said, trying to take care of his wife and trying to take care of five kids. Um, and there's other people like me, and I didn't know that. And so I somehow got linked up with the Elizabeth Dole Foundation, not sure how that happened. Um, they asked me to come, I came, I met 19 other military caregivers, and I now had a group of caregivers that I could, if nothing else, I could put a, we have a little Facebook post, I could vent on Facebook, and it felt good because I was venting to someone that understood exactly what I was going through, that knows what it's like to say that you're, you can't take someone to the movies, or you can't do this, you can't do that, or, or depression, all these things. So it's very nice for me to meet people um, that I could relate with. If I had advice to give to other caregivers, this is a forever business. I'm in a forever business. This isn't a temporary fix. This isn't something that that I'm going to do for a couple of days and then I'm going to farm it out to somebody else. Um, so you have to come to grips with that. I mean, it is a, I am 39 years old and hopefully for the next 60 years of my life I'll be a military caregiver. And I'm okay with that now. And I 
probably three years ago, I don't know if I could have made that statement. So I had to come to grips with the fact that this is a forever business. You have to stop trying to remember the person they were and love the person they are because they're different. So I fell in love with, with the woman who was the center of the universe that was the most outgoing, you know, crazy, rambunctious woman in the world. And today I'm in love with a woman who's not that. But her heart is the same. Her love for me is the same. Her ability to be a mom, uh, she's pretty awesome. But I had to learn that. I had to recognize the differences and I had to love my way through it. We make a lot of rules in our house. Um, and it's good because we have kids and kids need to understand rules. So kids need to understand rules like when mommy's sleeping, they come to me. Um, when she's not feeling good, they come to me. When she, when she is in certain positions of, of the way that she feels, then we go on to execute our plans of, and we know what those plans are. And it doesn't work perfectly, um, but it works as good as it can. So uh, people standing behind her is bad, so we don't stand behind her. If you're going to make a loud noise, you announce it before you make the loud noise. So if you're going to get ice out of the ice machine, you're going to turn on the garbage disposal. We make that, you know, we say, hey, turn on a garbage disposal, doing this. And it's just little things like that, but it really helps because it, it creates um, an environment for her to where she can kind of feel safe. And startling her is not good. Startling me is not good either. So um, I would tell you, your dreams are not done. They've just changed. So find new dreams <laughs> because how else do you do it? I mean, and that's, it goes, it always goes back to that to me is, is it took, the day-to-day -day stuff of the military caregiver is just, if you love that person, it's just something that you do. But it's the biggest thing is coming to grips with the fact that your whole reality has changed, you know? Your whole reality in life has changed. Um, and I would tell you this, don't let this consume you because this is not who you are. Being a military caregiver does not define me. I'm, I am me, you know? I'm a soldier, I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a guy who likes to play golf, I like to work out, I like to do these things. And sometimes people get in this environment and they become consumed by being a caregiver and that's all they think about and that's all they do and that's unhealthy. Um, so remember to be true to yourself and find time for that. My advice to people that want to help caregivers, this is not a band-aid solution problem. So don't try to put a band-aid on it. Um, respite care, like um, the lady I talked about earlier, respite care is awesome. But respite care is very hard because in most military caregiver situations, for most veterans, everything is based on relationships. If, you have, if you're dealing with someone that has TBI, PTSD, or depression, if you bring a random person into that house, it creates utter chaos. So the idea of just, hey, I'm going to throw respite care, you know, I'm going to give you someone to help you for six hours. Well, my wife, the first time we got respite care, made my wife sick as a dog because she cleaned the house before because she didn't want the house to look bad. She got nervous someone was there. You know, she wanted to put regular clothes on and all this stuff, and it just became hard. I mean, it was worse than it was without it. So things like that, when you're trying to, to, to put a hole in the dam, it's, just remember it's about relationships. If I bring my wife's friend in to do respite care, it's great. If I bring my mother-in-law and my mom, it's great. To bring a random person into the house is very difficult. Um, especially for a lot of veterans we have here. And don't judge book by their cover. And what I mean by that is, you know, I, I can tell you, so we have handicapped parking spot. So like I said, there's some days that my wife feels really good. And I had a lady come up, older lady come up and basically cuss us up and down for parking in a handicapped parking spot. And when that happens, my wife doesn't defend herself. My wife feels bad about herself. And any time that you look at these heroes that come back with TBI, with PTSD, with what we call invisible wounds, when you judge them and you look at them and say, well, they, do, they look fine, you know, that guy's walking and talking, you know, what's wrong with that girl? It is a horrible, horrible thing to do to those people because they, like, a, you know, they're not the people on the Budweiser commercial because you just can't tell that story. And America doesn't know that story. So, um, when you go out and if you can advocate anything for a lot of us military caregivers, it's, it's to tell people, hey, not military injured people coming back don't look a certain way. They don't. You know, they're, they're guys, they're girls, they're old, they're young. Um, 
So just be very cognizant that when you're dealing with veterans and all that stuff, you know, people want to, you know, they'll call me and they'll say, hey, we're, you know, we'll send your family to Disneyland for three days for all expenses paid. Look, you know, I'm doing a great thing for you. I can't go to Disneyland. My wife can't spend 45 minutes outside. And then you know what happens? I have to tell her, hey, we got invited to Disneyland. And she's like, oh, we can go. Oh, we can't go, honey. And then we, and then we talk about it, and then she gets sad, and then she feels worse about it, you know. You want to help a military caregiver two hours at a pop? That's good. We can do stuff for two hours, you know. If you want to give them a break, um, I guarantee you, if you, you know, things like house cleaning services or laundry services or yard work for a lot of people, little things like that, those are great things. Those are great things. But don't, too easy we get to this big, you know, Make-A-Wish Foundation idea of, hey, I'm going to take this, I'm going to sweep them off their feet and I'm going to do all these great things for them. And a lot of times it ends up being um, almost worse than better. Um, I want to close by saying that I struggle every day. I had a very long, I, I literally laid this out to my wife last night, and she said, every time I hear you speak, you have to remember that people out there struggle and you don't have it all together. And she's absolutely right. I don't have it all together. I will tell you that yesterday, we woke up at 8 o'clock, went to church, came back at 11 o'clock. My wife went to sleep from 11 to 4, so I clean, cook, try to get stuff ready. Uh, we wanted to do family movie night, so we woke up, went to the family movie night, came back. She went back to bed, and I was mad. I was upset because I felt like this is my one day off. You know, I want a little bit of help. And while I didn't, she would say I'm passive aggressive. Um, and I will. I still to this day. I make passive aggressive comments. I still to this day fail my wife. And it's because I'm a human being and it's because this is very, very hard. So please don't walk away from here thinking that I have it all together and that there is a, that there is a time in your caregiving life that you're going to have it all together because you're not. There's going to be days where you wake up frustrated and there's going to be days that you wake up sad. There's going to be days that you wake up and you wish it was all a different way. Um, because you're a human being. But if at the end of the day, you love your way through that day, then I think you've done okay. So I thank you for your time and for listening to me for the last 19 minutes, and I appreciate it. I can if you want me to. I got a couple minutes. Thank you. Kevin has agreed to take some questions if anyone has them, but please, we, I know you probably all want to have lots of comments to make and stuff, but try to keep it just to questions. Anybody? No? All right. Kevin, thank, thank you so much. What a beautiful story. That was truly a story of love of family, and I think Kevin gave us so much for us to take back and think about and share with our other members. We cannot be more proud to have the opportunity that we have to work with veterans such as you, Kevin, and your families. We are honored to be here today. All right, Nancy, it's yours. Thank you. Thank you. I too am impressed by the love of family and country demonstrated by strong veterans such as Vivian and Kevin. What a terrific reminder of the assets within our own military and veteran families. How about another round of applause for all of our presenters so far? So, we, we, you know, we're running just a little bit late, so we're not going to take a stretch break if you need to. Um, um, get up, that's fine. Please quietly if you need to use uh, the restroom, but please use the doors in the back unless you have uh, handicap access, which would be over here. Um, I'm really excited about this next upcoming session. It is actually a celebration of service and a demonstration of the American Legion Auxiliary's, uh, Auxiliary living its motto of service, not self. And I mean service in a big way like those in our midst and who take up the call to service as a full-time commitment. This past weekend, the American Legion Auxiliary Executive Committee adopted a resolution of support for the purpose and aims of the Franklin Project. 
Joining us this morning to tell us more about the Franklin Project is Senator Harris Walford. He is an outstanding example of service, not self. He volunteered for the Army Air Corps and served from 1944 until the end of World War II. Throughout his life, Senator Walford has served as an advocate of national service and volunteering. He served as President Kennedy's Special Assistant for Civil Rights and helped plan and launch the Peace Corps. In 1991, he was elected to the U.S. Senate from Pennsylvania and along with the Congressman John Lewis initiated and secured passage of the Martin Luther King Jr. Day of Service. Following his time in the Senate, he became the second CEO of the Corporation for National and Community Service. In 2013, he received a Presidential Citizens Medal from President Obama. Senator Walford currently serves as a senior advisor to the Franklin Project. Please welcome Senator Walford. Great to be very, with you. Very exciting. Thank you, uh, Pre President Brown. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Vice President Jeffords. Uh, just a little change of uh, initials, uh, Jeffords to Wofford's, just a W in place of a J. And uh, you look beautiful out there, except that I can't see you. Uh, I can say this about your work, though. I feel very lucky to have a chance to talk to you, f with you, for a few minutes. Uh, because I got re-familiarized on what you do in the uh, days coming up to this. And as one who uh, was uh, the, uh, a, a frustrated veteran who was an ardent interventionist before Pearl Harbor and after Pearl Harbor in high school, I wanted badly to get into the battle and I volunteered for the Army Air Corps as soon as they would take me, which was when I was 18. Uh, but it, those of us who came into the, the end of the war in 1944, at least those that went to Keesler Field and then got sent to Craig Field, Selma, Alabama, uh, we were stalled waiting to see whether we'd be needed, the pilots and navigators um, and, and uh, bombardiers for the Asian War. Uh, they didn't. But long ago it was, I uh, was in the American Legion, um, and the world moved on to other fronts, some of which we're talking about this morning. But after I saw all the extraordinary things that the American Legion Auxiliary is doing, um, a few days ago I rejoined the American Legion. So you've, you've produced... My grandmother came to me one day when I was 11 years old and said, would you like to go around the world with me on tramp trips, mostly on freighters? And I said, yes. And she said, I mean, really around the world uh, for six months, starting seventh grade over again, uh, and uh, doing it on this very low cost tramp trips in the midst of the depression. And I still said yes with enthusiasm and my apparent parents were brave enough uh, to say yes and put up the half fare I could get at 11. And I turned 12 on this extraordinary trip on the eve of World War II, uh, hearing the warnings uh, that Churchill was giving against Nazi conquest of Europe, um, hearing in the square in Italy Mussolini take Italy out of the League of Nations and declare the Second Roman Empire, um, seeing Gandhi in the streets of Bombay, looting Shanghai as tourists were doing after the Japanese had uh, devastated the city, hardly a roof was standing, and the center city had no human beings living there, and the Japanese army sold looting permits, and for an hour, 
I, with other tourists, mea culpa, looted Shanghai. Um, I tell you that just because the long journey uh, that involves uh, curiosity, adventure, patriotism, there's nothing like looking back on your country from afar and seeing uh, how great it is and how much it needed service and action to make it even better. So I think that the big idea that you have put before you in very well done words, and I love each of the words that is in the description of what uh, I'm, I'm about here, and uh, I would say the great Wendy Spencer, the head of the Corporation for National and Community Service, including AmeriCorps, uh, the, the big programs like City Year and, and Teach for America, uh, Vista AmeriCorps, which uh, you have a part of and have uh, made a tremendous contribution in, in the <clears throat> teamwork uh, with the Corporation for National Service and our extraordinary leader of it now. Let me just say that the big idea you have stated, well, you've stated a, an important part of it very well, and that's the part I'm asked to talk about a little bit. Um, a national cultural campaign is launching. That's sort of mysterious, is launching. It's not, uh, it's the corporation is launching it, it's not, uh, the creative organization is very much behind it, uh, service nation and, and be the change. Um, it's not, it's like the armed forces. We're talking about the forces for service in our society. So it's a campaign is launching to inspire each young American to voluntarily give a year of national military or civilian service as a rite of passage to full adulthood, including becoming an active duty citizen. The campaign looks forward to a day when a commonly asked question among Americans is, where did you give your service year? This session is going to offer background on that campaign and preview the campaign launching, which has a big, um, uh, a big occasion at Gettysburg, uh, not just on, because of the battle, but because of Lincoln's words there this June. Um, opportunities for the themes and messages around service as an expression of patriotism, uh, which is the business of the American Legion, uh, are, um, auxiliary, one of the uh, great works uh, is your youth programs and how it fits into this, um, I call it the big idea. The big idea is that some serious form of service is the common expectation and, and common experience um, of all Americans. All is the great American word along with ask, not to what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. General McChrystal uh, came back from uh, his outstanding military service in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, he came and talked to the Aspen Institute extemporaneously he said, speaking as a military man, we, I think, and many of us in the military think that the civilian service side should be about as large as the military, about equal, and work together, uh, about a million each. Well, right today, Wendy Spencer can give the up-to-date facts if she chooses to go into numbers, uh, there's some, 80,000 positions uh, in AmeriCorps and, and national service. And about half of those are full-time service. 
General McChrystal said to this Aspen Ideas Festival uh, almost a couple of years now, he said, this country needs a big idea. And one way to add momentum to the growth of national service would be to take a look at the 18 to 28, the first decade of, of citizenship, full citizenship, being an occasion when there's the opportunity for and the motive to serve full time in either military or civilian service. And out of that grew something called the Franklin Project in honor of Benjamin Franklin that Aspen Institute has endorsed. Um, but again, uh, the forces that are behind any big idea that's going to succeed don't come from any one project or any one organization. Uh, however great your auxiliary is, you're part of a great a range of the armed forces of the United States. So there are many of us in the unarmed forces of the United States. And, you know, I hope we find the way to sit down at a table and figure out what this could mean in terms of a quantum leap, uh, a really great growth in quantity and quality. Now, the the idea of such uh, a rite of passage for every young person began as for every young man, uh, as uh, voting uh, conveyed that forgetting the women as John Adams' wife uh, uh, chastised him for doing in the Declaration of Independence. Um, the, 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 uh, the background of this is William James, at the turn of the 20th century, in the early 1900s, wrote an essay, The Moral Equivalent of War, and proposed that all young men should be asked to, to do full-time service uh, for the country. In the spirit of service is your motto. Um, it stirred other people, Teddy Roosevelt, a whole range of Americans, and it was Franklin Roosevelt, hearing that there were half a million young men festering on the streets of America, not finishing high school, not employed, not getting a job. He said, I want those boys to go and to get into the woods and our public lands and to do uh, what has been neglected for so many years in conservation. And the Civilian Conservation Corps started and Roosevelt, when he signed the bill in about the 20th day of his administration, uh, he, he said, I want a quarter of a million boys in the woods by the end of summer. And July 31st, a Pennsylvanian, uh, later general, George Marshall was able to report as one organizing those camps that more than 300,000 young men were in 1,600 camps because the military came forward at Roosevelt's call and built the camps and provided the leadership. Um, and before that generation graduated into service of the military kind, more than three million American young men made great contributions to our parks and public lands um, and, and turned their lives around in many cases. A mistake was made, a great opportunity was made um, when uh, the Civilian Conservation Corps was terminated as everything was put into the war effort instead of keeping it on ice and ready to, to move again when the, you know, when the ice melted. It wasn't in existence anymore. Uh, by the way, Roosevelt didn't support the GI Bill, which is, I think, the single most important effective creative legislation in my lifetime. Unbureaucratic, simple, uh, a big idea. The various people have carried the torch of that idea. Um, Bill Clinton, when he ran for president, uh, proposed uh, 
what became known as AmeriCorps, he proposed that all young people would have the opportunity to serve full time and get out of, the, in addition to living expense, get a bonus for education, an education award that would help them pay for college or pay off their college loans. Uh, he proposed it. Uh, he meant it for all. All that Congress was willing to start was 20,000 positions, and the press treated it as a great defeat and deflation of what was the big idea that had, some said, stirred voters more than any other single thing that he talked about on the stump. I, I got swept in the change of leadership in the Congress from being a United States senator from, from Pennsylvania. Um, I got swept out in the 1994 election. Uh, having had an upset victory, I had an upset defeat uh, by aggressive young Congressman Rick Santorum. Uh, and the first thing that new Congress did was to terminate uh, the uh, National Service AmeriCorps program, to vote to terminate in the House. The Senate didn't move and held its ground. The president said that he'd veto anything that ended it. It didn't end, and during he drafted me to be CEO of the Corporation for National Service. Wendy is a great successor uh, to that job uh, and faces some of the same problems we did because the Congress today has, the House has not budgeted uh, voted to budget uh, the, 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 the current status of AmeriCorps. There was a high point uh, after we uh, saw, saw the, had a great, led by General Powell, had a great uh, summit in Philadelphia of all, of, almost all the social forces in the country, uh, the leadership came there and all the living presidents. And in due course, it led to the Serve America Act that, um, uh, that, that Obama, McCain, uh, Senator Hatch, conservative Republican, um, and a, a remarkable bipartisan group advanced this idea that there should be a quarter of a million positions for full-time service. That hasn't been funded uh, since it passed. Pre President uh, Obama had asked, along with health care, that the Serve America Act, which became Ted Kennedy's last bill, the, the Hatch-Kennedy, which in a moment of bipartisanship Hatch proposed be called the Edward M. Kennedy Serve America Act, uh, authorized a quarter of a million positions. Um, that hasn't happened. Uh, nor do I see the quantum leap that I dream uh, in my waking hours as well as probably in my sleeping hours. I dream of the quantum leap where it can be for all because that's when all will take it truly seriously. I think I may have just about finished uh, my hour, uh, namely uh, 15 or 20 minutes. Um, I, I, I want to end with what a great philosopher Martin Luther did to straighten out um, my wife and myself as to our different roles in life. Um, my wife supported everything I'm talking about now, but not everything that I did. In fact, some good disagreements on big things like Mahatma Gandhi and his applicability. We both had amoebic dysentery when we came back from a fellowship in the first year of our marriage. The year after Gandhi was killed, uh, we had amoebic dysentery and the cure was arsenic. Uh, being injected in your butt for about three months every week. And the, the doctor was saying, what a marvelous uh, medicine this is, as he stuck the needle in. He said, one ounce is going to cure you. Ten ounces would kill. And my wife, 
in her practical sense or skeptical sense, said, that's about what I think about civil disobedience. <laughs> One ounce sounds all right, but not 10 ounces of it. Uh, anyway, this philosopher, Martin Buber, after a long conversation with us, a great moment for us, he perceived that I had a very realistic wife. I had quoted a great line of his book, uh, Paths in Utopia, about how there could be an Arab Jewish brotherhood uh, uh, society growing, and it was being plowed under by the, the Israel uh, Arab vicious, vicious circle struggle. Um, and he had said in the book, a great idea can be plowed under, but it will rise again when idea and fate meet in a creative hour. And I said, do you see that hour coming? And my wife sort of interrupted and said, well, from what I've seen on this trip uh, to Israel and Palestine, it'll be a long, long time coming. And as we were leaving, he said to me, I hope you appreciate that you're married to a realist and a romantic like you who dreams like that um, needs a spouse uh, who is realistic. And then he turned to Claire and said, and you, dear new friend, uh, uh, I, I hope you know that though you are right, that there's a long wait between those creative hours when idea and fate meet. Uh, they do come. And I just hope that when one comes your way, you will not miss it. And so I like to think, granted what I have read about what you do in the spirit of service, that we're at one of those points where idea and fate can meet with your help uh, in a creative hour. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, so, Senator Wofford. Okay, where's my page? Well, uh, anyway, we are Farewell. so. Well, no, nope, don't leave. I just want to thank you so much for your service to our country, for your service to the country as a civilian. We are excited to work with the Franklin Project. I had the opportunity to meet your executive director, Jay. We had some great conversation. Um, Good. And a little plotting about. He's a real veteran. He's, he's a real veteran and how we can um, work together in the future. So thank you so much, Senator. Wonderful. I really do appreciate thank it. Thank you. you. Thank you. It was a pretty interesting meeting, and I, I think that it's very exciting as we think about and as the senator spoke about how service to America should become expected, not the exception, and I think it's pretty exciting. So as Senator Wofford indicated, AmeriCorps is one pathway already available to Americans of all ages to provide a year of national civilian service. The American Legion Auxiliary has parti participated in the AmeriCorps program since 2008. The American Legion's Call to Service Project. Our AmeriCorps project has provided hundreds of Americans, including the American Legion, SAL, and American Legion Auxiliary members, the opportunity to provide a full year of full-time national civilian service directed towards veterans and military families. Ladies, through the American Legion Auxiliary Call to Service Corps, AmeriCorps Project, we are giving American citizens the chance to be able to answer the core question posed by the Franklin Project, where did you serve? And so it is with great pleasure that I present to you this morning the Chief Executive Officer of the Corporation for National Community Service, the Honorable Wendy Spence. Spence Spencer. I'm sorry, Wendy. She has also served as the CEO of Volunteer Florida and director of the Florida Park Service in 2006.
President George W. Bush appointed Wendy to the President's Council on Service and Civic Participation. Wendy? There's, <laughs> Wendy? <laughs> Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Great to be Thank here. You. Great to be here. Hello, everyone. Good to see you. What a fabulous, fabulous room. And I'm so glad to, to be with Nancy again, your legions. I call her the first lady of the legion. I think that's great. We served together recently at 9-11 Day of Service. I think they've got a picture of us together somewhere up on the screen um, where we were serving at the Fisher House here in D.C., and preparing food and meals for the families. It was wonderful. It was a great organization. We love doing that. I love sharing the stage with my good friend and brother in service, Senator Harris Wofford, of course, is a, a great, great American, great patriot. Uh, we have a lot in common. We enjoy service to others. We enjoy giving back to our communities. And we certainly have an affinity for our military families. And I am one who is the wife, daughter, granddaughter, and stepmom of all men who have served in four branches of the military. And I didn't realize how many connections I had until this past summer. I was seating, for those of you who locally know that every Tuesday in the summer, there's a concert that the Navy hosts on the Navy Memorial. You should go, it's fantastic. On Tuesday evenings, free concert. And at the end of each concert, the first one I attended, they ask everyone to stand if you're a family member or a member of the military service as they, as they play the four theme songs. And so I stood at the first one, I think it was the Air Force, and I sat down and stood at the second one, the, uh, maybe the Army, and then I sat down and I stood up. And, fi and I kept standing and sitting, and this lady pulled on my shirt and she said, ma'am, you're only supposed to stand if you have a family member from the theme song. And I said, well, I do, all of these. And she said, oh, well, keep standing then. But <laughs> so she was going to call me out, but I loved it because we don't have Coast Guard yet, so I'm hoping maybe one of our granddaughters will join the Coast Guard. There's hope, so we'll get that one filled out, which will be fun. But it's fun to serve together. Nancy, thank you for including me, and thanks for having me here today. So we are the Corporation for National and Community Service, a federal agency with a unique name, but we are AmeriCorps and Senior Corps, 80,000 AmeriCorps members strong. 330,000 senior core volunteers strong. We have the Volunteer Generation Fund and the Social Innovation Fund. And so what that means, when you have this many AmeriCorps members and senior corps serving in 60,000 locations across America, is it just about any door that I step outside anywhere in the country as I travel the nation, I can just stand outside and holler, AmeriCorps, Senior Corps, are you out there? On some odd random street and somebody will holler about, yeah, I'm here, I'm over here. Now, I try this occasion, occasionally, and it's a little risky for me. It's worked so far, so I'm gonna give it a shot. I'll be real embarrassed if this doesn't work. So if there's any AmeriCorps Senior Corps volunteers out there who have either served or currently serving, AmeriCorps, Senior Corps, are you out there? Let me hear you. Yes, fantastic, it works. I'm so glad, everywhere I go, with 60,000 AmeriCorps members around the, I mean, 60,000 locations we're serving in. Uh, it's pretty spectacular, so I see we've got a great contingent here. Here's a one minute clip of a great little uh, video on our program I'd like you to take a look at. From the soldier returning from war, when we transition out, we need another mission. To the student in need of direction. I just didn't know how to say, say no to my friends. The community devastated by a tornado. I couldn't really grasp this has happened to my hometown. And the school in need of support. We need to focus on what it is that we can control from bell to bell. We say. I have now found my passion. Our parents and America kind of help us fix our own self. National service brought us hope. The extra attention that our senior corps volunteers are, are offering these kids makes a huge difference. Volunteer and help national service make an impact across this nation. Get involved in your community. Make a difference. National service works for America. Go to nationalservice.gov to find a volunteer opportunity that works for you. This message is brought to you by the Corporation for National and Community Service. What's, I hope you enjoyed that. I love that video. And what's so great is you see you, a bit of your mission in that as well, helping others. So focused on our military family members and our military personnel and our veterans. It's so important. And, and in your case, 
For more than 90 years, you have focused on the front lines and the home front, day in and day out, supporting our veterans, military family members, and their and military members and their families. And you're actually inspiring us as well to, to focus our efforts. But what I like is your effort on youth as well. Uh, this next sl slide is a photograph, I think, of the girls' nation there with the president in the middle and uh, at the White House. What a beautiful picture that is. One of your great programs there with Girls Nation. And then also the Junior Activities uh, program as well. This is important because just as Senator Wofford said, building our future, investing in our youth so that they can grow up and care as good citizens in our community. So I think it's a great focus. I compliment you for it. We want to be there to help you with this area as well. You'll see this next slide. It should show um, our different focus areas um, and talk about, I think, there you go, and there's veterans and military families. You actually inspired us to add that to our focus area uh, back in 2008, 2009, and we're real proud of that. It's uh, actually a top tier focus area for us, and the, you see the others, disaster, economic opportunities, education, environmental stewardship, and healthy futures. Um, but we're really proud of our work with veterans and military families for several reasons. One is, when we invite military members and families to serve in our programs, there's a really special secret sauce in that. Several things happen. We capitalize on the special skill set that our military members have, that they've gained through their experience, that our military family members have. Um, so we capitalize on that skill set. But also the, the veterans and the military family members, they gain a new skill set. It's a great transition back if our, for our young veterans who are returning back. This is a wonderful opportunity for them to sort of have somewhat baby steps back into what is now going to be their new normal. And it's not easy for everyone, but National Service gives them that bridge, that opportunity to, uh, to make that step and serve, continue to serve. And then just the last one is just those who are served uh, and you've served, if you volunteer alongside a military member or a veteran, um, you find there's something neat and special about that as well. So it just the service together is great. Now, a couple of our numbers I want to I share with you. Uh, this year, 2,500 AmeriCorps members will serve our veteran and military families. And what this means is 2,500 AmeriCorps members are focused directly on our military and our, and our veterans and our military family a community, directly, direct service to them. It's the largest number that we've had focused on this area in our history. Also, we've got 25,000 veterans serving in our senior core program. And they're serving with vet towards veterans and military issues, but in other issues as well. And when we talk about serving directly to support our veterans and our military families and military personnel, we're doing that with your help and also through 260 organizations nationwide. And we will serve 1.5 million veterans and military families uh, this year uh, in more than 200 communities across the country. That's about a $25.7 million investment and worth every, every penny. And you're benefiting. You're taking advantage of these grants. And I love your focus on service, not self. I think that is so important, service not self, which makes us a natural partner as well. And we've invested since we started, and Nancy mentioned the, the program, about $5 million, $4 million in the AmeriCorps members' living stipend and program dollars, and another $1 million in college scholarships. When you graduate as an AmeriCorps member, you get a small college scholarship to help you either pay back a student loan or to use to further your education. People often ask me, Wendy, you know, which is more important, national service like AmeriCorps or Senior Corps or volunteerism? And I say, you know what, I'm greedy, I want both. But there's a distinction between both, and I'm talking to members of Congress and leaders across the country all the time. What is the difference between national service? Well, we have military service, which is needed so greatly, which is so important, and the largest commitment an individual can make for our country. But national service like AmeriCorps, when you join AmeriCorps, you are saying, I'm going to commit a year of my life 
to this organization and this cause, they're going to be able to count on me to show up for duty, to serve a set amount of hours, to focus on an objective, to meet objectives and goals for this year, and I'm going to commit my, my life to that organization in the community I'm chosen to serve in. Volunteers are important too. Volunteers like me and many of you in the room, we kind of come and go as we please. Uh, we move from organization to organization, but we're valuable because we give our time, our talent. Sometimes we write a check to an organization, oftentimes we do, um, to an organization we care about, and we bring our friends and family as well along too. So there are benefits to both. But what's important, so many of us actually manage volunteers or serve alongside volunteers, and it's important to recognize volunteers. You know, I, I'll tell you, if you ask volunteers why they serve, they will tell you a little fib every time. They'll say, well, I serve because I care about my community and I care about this cause. They will never tell you they serve for recognition. But if you don't recognize volunteers, what will happen? You'll turn around and Jane or Bill or whoever was volunteering, you'll look next month and they're, they're gone. They just quietly left you. You don't know why, but they just didn't feel that they were, they, they, you know, they, their work was meaningful. And I had a hard lesson that I'll share with you on this one time. I served for 10 years for United Way raising funds. And every year in February, this group of senior ladies came in on the third Thursday of February and they stuffed envelopes. Uh, for a mailing that went out each uh, each February. And I walked by the door, and they were all in there uh, having a good time, stuffing envelopes. And I walked in, and I said, I want to just stop and thank you all for all the fundraising you're going to do today. And one of the ladies, the leader, said, oh, no, I'm sorry, you must have the wrong room. We're, we come every February, and we just sit here, and we just stuff envelopes, and we visit and catch up, but, we, you know, we're not, that's all we're doing. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. You don't realize that with this mailing that you're doing, you're going to raise $35,000 just from today's activities. And she looked and she stuttered and she said, well, I'll tell you what, if we come back tomorrow, can we raise $70,000? <laughs> but you see something so simple. No one for years had ever told them what their work, the outcome of their work. And now they were excited and wanted to come back and do more. A simple lesson, but an important one, right? To take the time and tell everyone we're volunteering with or those we're managing, tell them about the impact that they are having. So I think it's important. So volunteers are important. National service members are important. Uh, who knows? Maybe it was an American member that was organizing that back at that time. I can't even recall, but that's, that's very important. You have got some really good examples um, where you've got your call to service core, and I love that name, call to service core. One example is Carolina Geraldo, a civilian, is an America Vista member assigned to Impact Broward in Florida. That happens to be an RSVP, Retired Senior Volunteer Program there. Carolina is recruiting older veterans to serve as mentors to veterans under the supervision of the county's Veterans Court to help Veterans returning to community life with their everyday um, activities, very important. Matt Walding, serving through one of your call to service corps, is a veteran, a U.S. Navy veteran. He's an America Vista, and he's assigned to Mission Continues, a wonderful organization. Matt is recruiting veterans into that organization's fellowship program, which offers a civilian service opportunity for veterans transitioning from military to civilian life, and Mission Continues is a great organization uh, to do that. So many of the things that America members are doing for organizations add value, recruiting, managing new volunteers. I often ask an organization, would you rather have a check for $20,000 or have the time and efforts and leadership and capability of an America member for a year, which would you choose? And in every case, they said, oh, give me the AmeriCorps member, because they will lift the capacity much beyond what a $20,000 check would do. And, and just this morning, I was talking to Kathy with the uh, National Military Family Association, and she was telling me how the capacity of the organization was being lifted up through her AmeriCorps members and VISTA members. Um, and Kathy would tell you her story, too, if you have a chance to talk with her about it. So. 
think of it, it helps the organization and it helps themselves as an AmeriCorps member. If you join AmeriCorps, it's a pathway to economic opportunities. You gain valuable skills and leadership ability. You earn scholarships to help fund your education and even land jobs. I know t two who have landed jobs who are AmeriCorps members are now at the national headquarters for ALA, Laura Casey and Sharon Ricksecker. And yes, they've landed a job after serving. And, uh, and Laura Cooks is a mean baker, too. If you ever get offered to, to sit down with Laura, you should do so. She's got some fantastic cupcakes back, backstage. And I've, I've participated with Laura on a volunteer time, and she made some baklava that was great. But anyway, a side note. But, uh, but it is great to see that AmeriCorps can be an opportunity for someone as an individual. And that's why it's important for veterans to consider AmeriCorps as an option for them, especially these young veterans as they're transitioning. So when you think of national service like AmeriCorps, think of four key elements here. I'm gonna put on the, on the screen here. Passionate, dedicated people who give intense, sustained service, achieve community impact, serving in the organization to meet their mission, all while personally securing their own personal pathway to economic opportunities like the jobs that Laura uh, and Sharon both did, or other ways, furthering your education as well. So it's very, very important. So you, I mentioned earlier that you inspired us in 2008 and 2009, and this is when the partnership started here. Um, we have a photograph, I believe, of, uh, there you go, of an AmeriCorps, one of your vistas with President Obama. Uh, and in nearly five years, here are the interesting stats of the partnership we have with you. In nearly five years, the grants we provided um, have provided support for 169 full-time AmeriCorps and AmeriCorps VISTA members, benefiting 53 veteran, military, and civilian organizations, including several of your own departments um, and the ALA National Headquarters, which I think is very important. Another example of some of the work that they're doing, uh, Melissa Macias is assigned to USA Cares. There's the, the logo. I mean, look at all those organizations. That's just a few of them, a few of the 53 that have benefited. And I'll, and I'll tell you, point out to Melissa, she serves in USA Cares, serves as a family resource coordinator for the Combat Injured Program. She is a veteran, having served in opera, uh, support of Operation Enduring Freedom and Operation Iraqi Freedom with the 10th Mountain Military Police Battalion. She uses her military life experience now to help wounded warriors and their families access financial assistance for a range of challenges they face. This is important, folks, because if we're trying to help, especially a wounded veteran coming back, if they can connect with another veteran, there is, a, or a military family member, and I, and I give both the same credit, they are speaking with someone who understands their plight. And I do think that's important. Not that others who haven't served can't, but there is a special connection there uh, when you have served or you have been very closely connected through a family member. Nate Parsons and Zach Knitter, I met this morning, are assigned, another group assigned to the National Military Family Association. Among their duties, they're researching issues affecting military families and then creating content for family readers, the association publications, and also supporting a new mobile app, which was also launched a year ago with the help of AmeriCorps members. And Nate and Zachary both have family members who have served uh, in the military as well. Now there's some of our call to service corps here, Jamie, Stacy, Shane Cook, uh, Julia Tavald, and Holly Stout are all here today who have served with MOA and Got Your Six and the Code of Sport Foundation wonderful organizations that are benefiting from your partnership that you have chosen to do. Um, and so I really thank the AmeriCorps members and those who serve in the military. And I'd like us to just thank you for a minute. Will you stand if you've served in the military or you've served in AmeriCorps or Senior Corps and let us thank you quickly? Please stand so we can thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. That's my group over there. It's great. So as Senator Wofford said, wouldn't it be great if the question becomes very soon, where did you serve? Was it the military? Did you serve a nonprofit? Did you serve in AmeriCorps? Where have you served in your life? And the Franklin Project's great goal for one million young people, age 18 to 28, to serve somewhere, somehow, 
during that time period to help community organizations and to help themselves. I think it's a great goal. And we're working towards that goal. The President Obama just asked me to co-chair a new task force, the task force on expanding national service. So we're coming up with ways that we can help as well. So here's how you can help. You can ask young people you know and old alike. Uh, to join AmeriCorps, to join Senior Corps. You can think about, are you running an organization or serving in an organization that might benefit from a partnership like the 53 organizations that have benefited from the AmeriCorps or the AmeriCorps VISTAs uh, from the ALA partnership. Um, you can also help promote it. Go to our website. We've got a website there, nationalservice.gov, and look for opportunities that can serve as well. So there's lots of ways you can help. We're do trying to do our part, especially in the military and veteran space, um, to, for example, with homelessness. I serve on the U.S. Inter Council, uh, Agency Council on Homelessness, and I'm so pleased we've got a goal that 2015 we end veteran homelessness in veteran homelessness by 2015. People, we can get there. We can get there. And I'll tell you two cities that have already done it. Phoenix and Salt Lake City have already met that goal in their communities. That's what I call a big hag, a big, hairy, audacious goal that they met. Every city ought to follow suit. Every rural community ought to follow. This should be a priority. There is no reason any of our veterans in America should ever not have a roof over their head, ever. And we're gonna do that together with your help. We're also working very closely on our transitioning veterans and make sure that when they enter college that they graduate. The, the, one, the GI Bill is the most wonderful gift we can give a veteran coming back that wants to pursue a college degree. But not, not all of them are graduating, folks. But we have to make sure they graduate. So how are we trying to help? We're placing AmeriCorps members in colleges focused on the veterans who are enrolled in the college to make sure that they graduate, to make sure that they have everything they need to be successful as a college student, as a college student. And many of these AmeriCorps members are veterans themselves. And remember how I said that connection is important? that we have the two connected, that it really can help. So that's called our VET Success Program. I just love the name of that, VET Success. Make sure they're successful. We've got a partnership with the National Guard Bureau that we're working on as well to make sure that our bureaus can receive the help of veteran, of, of VISTAs and AmeriCorps members in state so they can help as well. So these are ways we can serve our country together through national service, through volunteerism, through civilian service, we can do this together. We are very proud of this partnership. And I love your theme, service not self. This partnership would not be possible without great leadership. And Bob Reig, I don't know where Bob is, I can't see him, but he's somewhere here. Bob Reig is your and our leader for the AmeriCorps program and he does an outstanding job. <laughs> Bob, thank you for your help. So with leaders like Bob and Nancy, uh, your First Lady, and all the partnerships we have and the 53 organizations you've worked with, with AmeriCorps, with Senior Corps, we're going to continue to be your champions to help support you and to help support the mission of the American League Auxiliary. Thank you so much for letting us be your partner and have a great, great conference. Thank you and God bless all of you. Wendy, thank you so much. I, I will tell you that we had, come up here, we had absolutely an incredible time on 9-11, uh, day of service. We cooked at the Fisher House, cooked. Um, Debbie was with us, the first lady, is, is she here? It, I don't know if she's in the room. I know that she's signed up, but she probably has something important she's doing. Um, but we had a blast. We made lasagna. We, we did. cooked. We cooked. Where's Sharon? Sharon did Sharon the menu. Was here. Sharon was there. We did some crazy Greek things. The that baklava. We yeah. And what was interesting is, is I'm not a very good cook. My husband is. We have chefs in our family. My husband says the only thing I really make well 
is reservations. <laughs> so this <laughs> So this was a, a good experience for well, me. Well, it really was a lot of fun because there were a lot of young members, too, from the new unit yeah. here in Washington, D.C., Unit 1. And we sort of had to guide them a little bit about, no, you don't put the chicken on the same cutting board as the vegetables. <laughs> so, but it was a lot of fun. I think we had a really, good really time. great Let's time. Do it again. We're going to do it again. So again. I'd like you, we need to have my oh, coin, so my much. National Presence thank coin. We are so thrilled to be partners with the no, community great. service. It's just great, and we're going to continue our hard work together. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Thanks so Thank much. You. Thanks, Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very Thanks, much. everybody. Thanks for your work. Thank, Thank you. you. We really did have a blast. It was really fun. OK, so National Secretary Dubby, do you have any messages? Um, because of the delay, um, well, let me let, first, oh, this, is this as loud to you as it sounded to me right now? Is it too loud? That better? Okay. I don't want to scream at you. Um, uh, because the more, uh, we're going to reconvene at 1.30. Probably the first thing you want to know. We're going to reconvene at 1.30 because we had so much great information and so many questions. You all can look at your watches. We we're, ran a little bit over, but do you think it was worth it? Yes. Right. So, um, so the announcements are um, because of, of our readjusted in, readjusting, re, take four, because of our readjustment in the schedule, uh, will the Parade of Check presenters meet at the back of the ballroom here at 1.15? So if you're, being, you're going to be in the Parade of Checks, be in the back of the ballroom at 1.15. And again, the afternoon session will begin at 1.30. And will the Parade of Checks uh, representatives from the following states please see our controller, Tim Bresnahan. Tim, can you, you wave? And our PR guru, Stacy Polka, there at the back of the room. We need the Parade of Checks representatives from Oregon, Maryland, and Colorado. So as you're exiting the room, uh, please see uh, Tim and Stacy at the back. Also, just a, a friendly reminder, uh, we get very engrossed in our work. We understand that. When opportunities exist to ask questions, uh, it's kind of a two-parter. One, when you ask your question at the microphone, could you then step back? Because <sighs> we could hear you breathing <laughs> while our guest was trying to respond. And secondly, um, could you be as concise as possible and remember that we're you were asking a question and not delivering um, uh, a lot of a lot of comments. We all know we have a lot of comments, but if we could be a little more concise in asking our questions, we'll try to stay on track in the afternoon. Uh, two uh, other announcements: uh, the uh, Department of Illinois and the Department of Washington reception that is tonight from six to nine p.m. is in room five one zero zero. 5100, and the Department of Vermont reception that is tonight from 6 to 8 p.m. is in room 5101. So, if you want to go to reception, go to the fifth floor, you'll find them. <laughs> now, two final things. Does this look familiar to everybody? Okay. There are two boxes up here on stage. This, we ask you to answer these questions for those of you who weren't at the NEC meeting um, and haven't already heard this, uh, in getting a um, status report on our awareness campaign and we've just adopted the strategic plan where the next step in awareness is to um, become part of phase one or the launch of the strategic plan, one of the things that our uh, professional PR firm wants to know is 
what do you think, and this isn't rocket science, so you're, you're not to belabor this question, but what comes to mind when you would be asked, what do we do exceptionally well to meet the needs of veterans and their families? So if you'll answer this question, it's a top of the head response, and the box is up here. Also, in this afternoon's question, or uh, this, this afternoon's session, how many of you have one of these? Okay. You've seen the poster, you know what you're supposed to do. Understand these will be looked at to be eligible for the drawing, and you have a copy of the magazine that has the plan giving guide in it. Before we have the plan giving presentation, you're to come up and put your question in this, in this box. Those questions are going to be looked at. So if your question is, what color are Mickey Mouse's shoes, you will not be eligible. <laughs> the question has to be a legitimate question about planned giving. You are given a copy of the magazine that has the planned giving guide in it. So the purpose is, read through that planned giving guide and what in that is a, is a legitimate question that you have. And those who drop one of these in the box with a legitimate question on it will be eligible for the drawing. So again, we're back in the room at 1.30. Parade of checks back in at 1.15. Madam President, those who conclude the announcements. Thank you, Debbie. So this concludes the Monday morning session of the Washington, D.C. conference, and I hope you all enjoyed it. Um, I don't know, I was pretty taken back by those two little guys. It was pretty cool. So I hope you enjoy your lunch, and our conference resumes in this room at 1.30. Thank you.